Okay, so welcome to the September um, 11th East Chester Board of Fire Commissioners monthly meeting. Um, we already had the uh, executive session we just came out of. We did the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And tonight we're going to have Paul, Lieutenant Paul Radalone start the meeting with a narrative about he does it every 9-11, um, speaks about his time uh, going down to the pile uh, right after the days of 9-11. Uh, so, Lieutenant Radalone, would you like to come up and present? Is this okay? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you all for allowing me to make my presentation at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, the first half of my presentation was written uh, the first few days after 9-11, and the rest of it in the weeks and months following. Uh, from Wednesday, September 12, 2001, through Sunday, September 16, the East Chester Fire Department sent a fully manned engine and ladder company to cover Bronx firehouses or to stand by at Yonkers Raceway for deployment. I was at Station One and remember feeling worried about these, these mutual aid companies, not knowing what might happen to them. On Thursday, September 13th, Mount Vernon Fire Department Local 107, in conjunction with the Westchester Professional Firefighters Coalition, was able to contact officials in New York City in order to organize a relief effort. After getting approval to do so, they contacted all professional firefighter unions in Westchester. In a matter of a few hours, 120 firefighters from all over Westchester met at Mount Vernon Station 3. Included in that number were 10 firefighters from Eastchester. Two EFD members were able to get three buses at no cost. One of those members was Vincent Spadaro, who just passed away a few months ago. Shortly before 7 p.m., the three buses left Mount Vernon with a state police escort to Manhattan. Almost from the time we turned onto, west, onto the West Side Highway, People lined both sides of the street with signs and flags, many thanking us and cheering. Signs read, God bless you, and you're our heroes. The buses parked off Hudson Street on Beach Street. Upon arrival, all firefighters were organized into 10-man companies with either a lieutenant or captain in charge. I took command of the Eastchester contingent. We walked from the buses to the staging area, one block from what has become known as Ground Zero and what the firefighters was called the pile. Along the way, people on, on, si on the sidewalks clapped and thanked us, offer offering us water, food, gloves, masks, and anything else we might need to do our work. Walking along, we could see and smell the smoke from what was once the World Trade Center. At the staging area, we saw an engine and ladder truck on a side street. The truck's aerial was mangled and bent over the cab. The engine was recognizable only by the front part of the cab where the driver and officer would sit. Everything else had been crushed to about five feet high. On the officer's door, someone had written in memory of lieutenant and firefighters who apparently had all been killed. After getting permission to proceed, we passed a parking lot filled with burnt out cars. We stood in front of three World Trade Center, excuse me, three World Financial Center, now used as a rest and rehab station. Construction workers cut up the fallen North Bridge in preparation to move it out of the way in order to gain access to the main area of debris behind it with heavy equipment. We walked between three and four World Financial Center along the Winter Garden Atrium and into two World Financial Center from to the front entrance on West Street. From this point, we got an unobstructed view of the massive destruction. From, from this entrance to two World Trade Center, a distance of about 400 feet, were steel box beams lying parallel, about three feet apart, on top of 10 to 15 feet of concrete and other pulverized debris. There were several hundred rescuers and about a dozen bucket brigades removing debris from around the seven-story stump of the tower and passing it down to the front of the, uh, finan the financial center, where it was dumped and the empty buckets returned to the front of the line. Iron workers cut up steel beams, which would be passed down the line and thrown on the pile. We filled in for several of these lines, balancing ourselves on the box beams. In some areas, you could look through the rubble and see the remains of a fire truck or ambulance. Several of our firefighters attempted to tunnel beneath the box beams in order to look for victims below us. Every so often, someone would yell to be quiet. The generators and power tools would be shut down, and everyone would stop working and just listen for any sounds from the pile, from the debris pile. After a minute or so, work would continue. Looking up around from the middle of ground zero gave us a clear view of the destruction. Every window facing the Twin Towers had been blown out and chunks of buildings had been gouged out from falling debris. 
The sides of the remaining buildings were covered in a thin coat of, coat of power that could be seen floating in the air through the glow of floodlights. It was several inches thick for many blocks around the site. Despite the hard work, early Friday morning it got noticeably cooler, and about 2 a.m. it started to drizzle. It uh, started to rain, the drizzle at first. Suddenly it started getting heavy, making footing treacherous. And since we were working in t-shirts, the rain just made us wetter and more uncomfortable. An FDNY chief officer called off operations, and our chief officers decided it was time to go back. So we picked up our gear and headed back to the buses. On the buses, we were tired, cold, and wet. There was little, if any, talking on the return trip to Mount Vernon. I began to wonder what we had accomplished by going down there. We moved perhaps a couple of tons of debris, a literal drop in the bucket of the estimated 1.2 million tons of rubble. We had saved no lives. Only one body had been recovered. Yet for eight hours, we had been willing participants of a piece of history, something people will talk about long after we are gone. We were the first group of firefighters to go down to the ground zero, and, but not the last. Two shifts of Westchester firefighters, Eastchester included, per day, responded to the World Trade Center site over the course of the next several days. The only reason this effort was discontinued was the FDNY went to a 24-hour schedule with half of their personnel working at any one time meaning they had enough manpower to send to the site and man their, their firehouses. Whatever needed to be done or whatever we were asked to do, we would not have hesitated on this new day of infamy, September 11, 2001, respectfully submitted Lieutenant Paul Ryan alone. Uh, the firefighters who attend, were there that day with me were firefighters Quentin Baker, firefighter Joseph Pinto, Stephen Ryan alone, James Rockhill, Ken Simonides, Glenn Strawbridge, Ryan Tween, Vincent Spadaro, and William Wiggleman. Of the estimated just under 3,000 um, victims of that day, there are still over 1,000 victims who have not been identified. The remains have never been identified. And also, of the thousands of workers who went down there to, to, for the recovery, I believe it's about 150 of them so far have died from um, the um, carcinogens, from various in illnesses caused by the uh, exposure degree that was down there yeah. while they were working. Um, the rest of my report was written in the weeks following. Starting on September 11th and con continuing for days and, and months afterward, ordinary people, organizations, and businesses donated money, food, water, and clothing to victims and rescuers. A couple of weeks later, Mount Vern, uh, excuse me, a couple weeks later, Local 916 had a fill the boot fundraiser at the intersection of Mill Road and White Plains Road and collected over $20,000 for the FDNY Widows and Children's Fund. In one day, four hours, $20,000. One week after 9-11, an estimated 6,000 people filled the property outside Town Hall for a memorial service with political representatives from East Chester, Tucko, and Bronxville. The clergy of almost every faith that has membership in the town offered words of blessing and comfort to all. The three police departments, the fire department, and EVAC were all well represented. Weeks later, the fire department and police department paid a ch played a charity basketball game. Local 916 spotted, sponsored the collation for the funeral of fire marshal and Tuckahoe resident Ronald Buca at Concordia College. Members attended numerous funerals. Thanks to retired FDNY Lieutenant Bill Spinelli, and as a direct result of our sale of the FDNY 343 hats, George Glover Jr. and I were invited to attend the FDNY memorial services held inside Madison Square Garden in October of 2002. While well, it was a cold and rainy day, about 30,000 firefighters from across the country and around the world marched in a parade prior to the services. It is amazing what can be accomplished when people put aside their differences, get together, and work for the common good. Thank you very much for the opportunity to read this. And thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, you for your time, time uh, working downtown and your service to the department. There is probably no firefighter in probably New York State that has your attendance record. Um, and uh, says there's his brother one, from the second, back. Uh, a brother in the back has his hand up, and I mean a brother brother, not a brother brother. <laughs> Okay, and thank you, Paul. Um, in the spirit of um, trying to be civil and communicative, I would like to respond on the chairman's remarks of um, last m meeting we had um, was a fairly um, 
spirited meeting, and I think I'd like to clear up the um, remarks to the point where um, we had a question about Mary Lou Falcone's appointment to the fire board uh, as, a, as an employee, and I just want to go through her employment history and do this in, a, in, in, a, in a, uh, just a very matter-of-fact way, so it's not, I'm not trying to get anything but that. She was appointed to the fire board, in, uh, in fire board as an intermediate typist in May 2013, three commissioners, O'Hare, Baker, and Winter. Um, right after she was appoint appointed to her intermediate typist position, we hired an independent consultant uh, to work for the department to handle um, unpaid night nice ship payments that were due from prior employees. And that fellow came on board at $28 an hour as an independent consultant because we didn't have any other slots to put him in. The following January, with Mr. Inkladon on the board, we gave the first meeting he attended, she was an intermediate typist position. We gave her a, 20, uh, a raise to $28 to match the same raise as the male in the same position. Uh, so we had two employees working in the same office doing similar work. And uh, the one was an employee, one was a consultant. Both didn't receive any benefits, and we matched the salary, and that was a board decision to give her a salary increase, and there were four board members that voted on that, Peter Inkladon, Jerry Napolitano, Stephen Baker, and myself. Did you underpay her to begin with? Is that why you raised the salary? I'm trying not to be confrontational. I'm just going to go through the history, and then we can, we can go through here. Um, she was bought in at $22.50, and that salary was negotiated by uh, the person who interviewed her which was John Molazari. I don't believe any board members interviewed her. We took John's recommendation. Okay, and turns out she had a bachelor's degree and about 30 years of experience in doing uh, office work, and she was very valuable. So, the um, the following the following February, February 2015. Uh, so a year later and a month, she was given in the same position, intermediate typist. She was given a um, 56 cents increase. 2%. Uh, the person who was working at a consultant at the same time, February in 2015, was also given a 56 cent increase that year. He resigned right after that <coughs> increase, within days of finding out he got 56 cents. 50 cents it was. 56 cents, and Commissioner Lorry uh, and uh, was not in favor of the 56 cents at that time. Because I thought it was a shame to give a man 56 cents raise. I agree, and he resigned at that moment, after he got the raise. So what happened then, Westchester County came to us and said they need to change the title for Mrs. Falcone because the intermediate type is code 018, 0180-2 was being eliminated countywide. So what we did is we had a board meeting. And at that board meeting in May 2015, we decided that we'd ask Westchester County if Mary Lou Falcone could be subject to her approval, we would make her Secretary of the Board of Fire Commissioners. That, in May 2015, seven months prior to her January 2016 appointment, which is where I think the confusion came around. Um, this is seven months before the, our annual reorg meeting, the board met passed a resolution saying, let's ask Westchester County if Mary Lou Falcone could become Secretary of the Board of Fire Commissioners. Now remember, John Molazari at the time was Secretary slash Treasurer, meaning he was the Treasurer and the Clerk of the Fire District because he was Treasurer slash Secretary, two titles. And that was historically how it was done. Um, so we do that resolution. We advise the, the uh, chief at the time, Mike Grogan, and we advise the board, not me, the board members all voted to do it. Um, we advise the treasurer, John Molzari, and the chief. And typically, Westchester County deals with either the chief or the treasurer. They don't deal with the chairman of the board. They deal with those two guys because um, they want to deal with the career people. So. That happens. I get a phone. I get an email. John Mol John Molzari passes away on November eighth, two thousand and five. I get an email on December seventh, two thousand fifteen. Two thousand fifteen. I'm sorry, uh, December eighth, two thousand and fifteen. 
six months after, almost six months to the date after the board asked Westchester County to make Mary Lou Falcone Secretary of the Board of Fire Commission subject to their approval. As soon as John passes away, at our next board meeting, we have an issue now because we need a health care administrator. Remember, in 2013, Chief Grogan uncovered that we had 15 or 20 employees who were not paying their health care and retire, no, not health care, retirees, retirees former, employees. Reti former employees, retirees, not paying their health care for like 15 years. And we uncovered about $800 to $1 million worth of issues over it. John Molzari was acting as our health care administrator. So when, and you have to tell NYSHA who your health care administrator is. They're just not going to talk to anyone. So at that board meeting on December 16, 2015, the board voted to make Mary Lou Falcone the health care administrator. That vote was Mr. Baker, Mr. Laurie, Mr. Inkladon, Mr. Winter. Now, we gave her an increase to $35 an hour to give her those, because we just giving her those extended duties. So that was a $7 an hour increase. Again, not Dennis Winter by himself unilaterally giving out this raise, but a board decision based on the fact that we needed a health care administrator. If we follow through on that same meeting, we had a firefighter named Chris Ryan who was in the wrong pension system for approximately 10 years. We had to write a check to New York State Pension System. The union had requested us to correct the situation. The board agreed it needed to be corrected. It was going to cost about $100,000. The deal was the, board, the union had to get the paperwork approved through, I think, Jeff Klein's office to get it moving forward because it requires a change in law. Right, they, had, and they had to pass a special resolution in law in Albany. To correct. Allow this to happen. Right. So they, they got all that paperwork done, and now we had to have a clerk sign off that the person executing those documents was a fire district clerk. The board appointed an acting clerk at that time uh, for the Ryan paperwork to be Mary Lou Falcone. That vote was Baker, Laurie, Inkladon, Winter abstained. I abstained because I couldn't be, I didn't, she would be executing the paperwork I'm signing. So I abstained, just like she was a notary basically. January 2016, the board has already approved Mary Lou Falcone to be Secretary of the Board of Fire Commissioners seven months before. At that point in time, we do our annual reorganization appointments. John Molzari is now dead, and we appoint, uh, the appointment is done by the same salary level, Commissioner Baker, Winter, Inkledon, Laurie. Again, not unilaterally. On January 30th, 2016, roughly two weeks later, um, oh, I also get an email on December 7th, 2015, after John died, from the Westchester County Department of Union Services to the chief CCing me. Um, and it says, we've been trying to get this paperwork done for Mary Lou Falcone. What's happening? I respond back and say, John Mulzari died. Our council name is Cheryl Sacco. I have applied the email address. Please contact Cheryl Sacco. That's as much as I had to do with it. In January 30th, 2016, we hold a board meeting. We hire a treasurer, Jamie Henstrom. That vote was Jerry, Mr. Jerry Nalpantano, Mr. Baker, Mr. Ingledon, Mr. Laurie, Mr. Winter. Okay? So when, Jerry, when Jamie came on board, she has to reach out to Westchester County. Westchester County, they reach out to her, and she starts doing the paperwork for herself and for um, Ms. Ms. Falcone because it hadn't been done at that point in time. So this all was recapped, except for one line, because Ms. Hengstrom wasn't here in May 2015 to know that fact. She, Mrs. Jamie recapped the whole hiring process and how Westchester County did not view it as a hiring, but simply a reclassification of title. And I can read this whole thing that Jamie has here. Jamie is missing the one board meeting in May 2015 where the board approved it. I have the minutes here if anybody would like to read them. Um, so it wasn't Dennis Winter unilaterally deciding we're going to give bestow because I had some personal agenda with Mrs. Falcone that I'm bestowing these 50% raises on her and I'm taking care of her and 50% raises. 50% raises, yeah. 
and where she ended making about $770 a week for us. And she worked about 22 hours a week. So I, from, from the whole hiring, the whole appointment, and when she took that position, we did have a secretary treasurer, John Molazari. So I'm lost at all, the, all that issue. As far as the health, the cost of what it cost to, uh, so I don't think I bestowed personal um, raises on her. I think the board did. Um, my involvement was writing the resolution to ask Westchester County to approve it and then passing it on to the attorney on December, uh, December 15th, December 7th, 2015. As far as the cost of giving an employee health care, it's not $15,000. It's $11,332 in this woman's case. If, in her case, she was not a member of the New York State Retirement System, which she was entitled to be. If she jo the next employee joins the New York State Retirement System, which I'm pretty comfortable she's going to, whoever we pick, uh, that's cost us about $5,000 a year. So if I take the $11,000 and I subtract the $5,000 that it's gonna cost us for the person to join the retirement system, the number we're talking about here is about $63, $6,500 of a salary number or cost to the department of replacing that employee, which is about 42% off of the $15,000 number, okay? If I talk about someone having a personal agenda with legal bills, like with legal things that um, we have to change how we do business and have one person communicate with the lawyers because there's a personal agenda. If I go through this month's legal bills, which we're going to approve tonight, you're going to find $1,351 for one topic. That topic alone was allowing the commissioners to get NYSHA insurance. They have to pay for it fully, but we as a board pay are going to pay, we as a department are going to pay $1,351 over the course of July to have the attorneys draft that resolution. That, now, that benefit may inure to me at some point if I ever use that insurance. I voted to abstain because I don't, at this point in time, plan to use it at the price increase of 9%. I don't know if I'll use it anytime soon. I have a couple of years to figure it out. But that benefit, I didn't direct the lawyers to draft that. I didn't push that point. So I'm lost at that thing. As far as fraud in the department goes, uncovering fraud, I brought with me tonight, and I'm going to pass these out, um, is why I'm so passionate about the volunteers and the volunteer lawsuit. And you can pass that down to Mr. Laurie, if you could. Pass yourself. Okay. Pass Sorry. Um, I'll pass it down. And I brought copies for the public. Chief, if you want to pass a few out, or somebody wants to pass a few out, I'll keep one for myself. Did I keep one myself? I kept one myself. Okay. So, do I think from time to time that things go unchecked and there'll be problems? What I'm passing out here, it's an older document, but it's still current because um, we haven't been able to get, even despite a court order, we haven't been able to get the current documents. So what this document says, in 2002, the Volunteer Benevolence Station told New York State they had $774,000 in their bank account. Let's go to the audited financials for the same year, the same date, the same, you know, same organization, okay? And we're going to find out the number is not $2.2 million. Where's my, where's my number? Have you guys got the copy there with the number on it, this page? I'm missing a copy. Here you're looking for I'm looking for the page that has the audit on it. It's like the 2.6 million? I don't have it. Where's the last page? Well, they have 2.6 million. Did I miss? Oh, there it is. The balance as of 12-31-2002 is 2.6497 in the audit financials. The document sent to New York State is $774,132. So you might say, well, what's the difference? The difference is they don't have what they distributed to the volunteer companies in this document. And what they distributed to the volunteer companies, if I didn't print this right, I may not have printed these right, um, is on this page here. So in the two years between 2001 and 2002, 
it looks like a cumulative total of $146,667 got distributed to the companies. And where did it go? That was in 2001 and 2, 146667 So do that every year for 15 years and see how much money we could be possibly talking about. So when the volunteers, when the board is, has a contempt of court motion pending against the volunteers for not producing documents, and the volunteers are willing to go and take the risk of attempt a court motion, it's important to look at old financial documents and see maybe there's a reason why they're a little upset about us and not answering a contempt of court motion. So um, that's what I'll have to say about that. As far as um, what I was a little upset about is the idea that you can have and in that document I passed out, they have a formula how they're going to distribute the money around the volunteer companies. So it's formulaic. And I think they're trying to get up to a half a million dollars to the volunteer companies, um, which based my research tells me. And then if I look at the, um, the last week's resolution where the board, I'm, now I've been on the board 12 years. I've been communicating with council always for those 12 years. The volunteer lawsuit, the hydrant lawsuits, the the, uh, anything we've been involved with, I've been involved with. I know where every file is, pretty much every file at this point in time in this fire department. Um, and we have files in the storage room in Bronxville. We have the files downstairs in the basement. And like somebody like Jamie Henstrom has been here a year and a half, probably knows where a third of those files all are. Chief Grogan, which is not Chief Grogan, Chief um, Tween, who's been on with us four months, he might know where 25% of the files are, 20%. Chief Grogan in the back of the room will probably know where 100% of the files are, maybe 110%. Um, I, um, I happen to know where they all are, and the lawyers call up and say, hey, what do we got this, or what do we do there? And I tend to go to the file rooms and dig them out and find stuff, like documents like we're seeing here. So I, I, to, to restrict my ability to talk to the lawyers, and the vote on that is taken by a commissioner who we have to get a court order to not talk. This last June, I think it was, we got a court order so the commissioner would not communicate with the lawyers representing the volunteers. That's, I mean, that's, that's not true. Okay, it's not true. It's not okay. true because I never received no court order. Right, your lawyers did though. Your lawyers I, were I don't told. I know what the lawyer received, but you keep telling people that I received the court order well, not to be speaking to anybody and I received no paperwork from no judge or no lawyer. Okay. So stop telling people false statement, Dennis. Okay. I don't like that. You got a I'll very, clarify it. I'll you clarify have a very it. bad habit of lying. Okay, I'll clarify that. The law firm representing the volunteers, we had to go to court to get a cease and desist order and uh, to get one of their lawyers from talking to Mr. And that was because at a board meeting, Jerry Napolitano, who is, who is sitting here, took his cell phone out and took a picture of the email communication and we forwarded that to the court and then the court and that's what started the mess. That's how sneaky you are. Yes, Jerry. You, I'm talking to you. <laughs> so, I didn't say anybody. You, I so, said. So, but I'm just saying is, to me, what's going on here is I think a character assassination on my part, a mischaracter, not on my part, against me, uh, a mischaracterization of the facts, how Ms. Falcone was hired, how she was treated, and the fact that we didn't give her health care um, when I brought up to the attorney at the time that we're not giving Ms. Falcone health care and we knew some issues she was having, I, he said to me, you may want to get her back. So I did make phone calls to commissioners and said, hey, can we hire her back? That was, that is correct. I did make those phone calls, but I do also do know, which I can't say for HIPAA reasons, what the reasons were, but I thought it was important that a woman of her age and was, I just thought she wasn't treated perfectly. Okay, that's where I'm coming from. Now, as Dennis, far as a code you're, of you're, ethics. You're sharing information that no other board member was aware of to paint yourself in a positive light for, you know, spearheading the effort to provide health care to Mary Lou. And I just think it's unfair that you're going to sit there and say that, you know, you did it for these altruistic reasons when nobody else on the board knew what was going on. 
and it was it was never discussed. It was never brought up by you. Okay, okay, and, and so, you know, like, uh, this is a little bit late. Okay, now let me go on a little further. Um, as far as the Code of Ethics go, if I look at the Code of Ethics, our current Code of Ethics in the Fire Department, I'll just read a section of the Code of Ethics, and commissioners can judge themselves or whatever. Section 4, appearance of impropriety. No officer or employee of the fire district, no member of the fire district fire department shall create the appearance by giving the impress impression that he or she will exercise or perform his or her duties on the basis of family, private business, or any consideration other than the welfare of the fire district. And that is that point. Um, so I think I covered most of the issues um, that were brought up at last month's meeting. I have tried to do it in a manner not to be hostile and not to be confrontational um, and also defend, you know, what little reputation I have left. So that's where I'm at. And uh, yeah, I'd like to make a few comments. You're welcome to. Okay. Uh, Mary Lou is a fine employee, and I, you know, don't want to give the impression that I, I feel that she wasn't. Uh, but Mary Lou was hired in May of 2013, as Dennis says, and by 2016, she was making 48% more than she was making just two and a half years earlier. I would ask anyone in the department, from our treasurer, our former treasurer, our chief, our assistant chief, and all the firefighters, if anybody over that period of time saw anything remotely close to those level of salary increases, they have not. Dennis talks about, you know, the health care being a minor issue. Oh, it's only 12000 It's not the 15 you said. It's, well, first of all, our health care costs increased by 10% this month. But what Dennis is leaving out is that at any time, Mary Lou's status could have changed. She could have gotten married. She could have applied for the family plan instead of an individual plan. That cost would have been $25,000. We would have set a precedent by giving Mary Lou health care, and then anyone who's a part-time employee of the district would be entitled to health care. So this could have easily gone from... Uh, you know, a zero cost benefit to something that was costing the district $60,000 a year, okay? And more if we hired further part-time employees. You know, Dennis also talks about how he hired Mary Lou and, and you know, like the, you know, the fact that uh, we had no choice but to give her the title of secretary to board of fire commissioners. That's not true. It's just simply not true. Dennis had, there were other titles that were available, office administrator, and again, there was another title that I, I wish I had you know, gotten the name of, but Dennis decided that he wanted Mary Lou to be secretary to board of, of board of fire commissioners, and I did support it. I supported it in particular because Dennis, you know, had assured us he was the one who was interacting with her most on a regular basis, that she was good at what she did, and I kind of agreed from the interaction that I had with her. But he also the the issue of of her residence key came up, and he told me that you know the reason why we can hire her, even though she's an out of town resident is because she's being hired to as secretary to the board of fire commissioners a distinction from being hired as fire district secretary Which and that's and that, and that's what that's what got my support okay uh if i had known that she wasn't you know she had you, there was a town law that required someone to live in town first i would have suggested that we look for in-town applicants first but instead dennis pushed hard for this and you know now in hindsight you know reluctantly i agree so we're talking about an employee who saw f almost 50% in raises over a two and a half year period, and then a commissioner who spearheaded the effort to grant her an additional benefit that was worth 12,000, 13, what was your number? That could have easily have gone to $25,000. Despite the fact that literally two months earlier, we appointed this woman and we told her that health care was not included in her compensation package. She took the job knowing that full well. Now Dennis is sitting up here now and telling everyone, well, if she had a health issue and you know, like I was doing the right thing, no, nobody knew what the story was, and who knows? I mean, I, I, not that we should have been making decisions based on those things anyway, but perhaps we might have reevaluated the situation or found a way to help her out to, to bridge a, a period of, of, of difficulty in her life. But it's, you know, I, I just, I think that the chairman has, has consistently uh, misled me and other members of this board. And like I say, the, the, the numbers are the numbers. Look, nobody got anywhere near a 50% raise. You know, as far as some of the other issues that Dennis has raised and his conflicts, you know, I just want to point something out because I think it's, it's critically important. And this, is, this has to do with the hiring of my sister-in-law and Dennis's, uh, you know, accusations that somehow I was violating the code of ethics. 
and you know forcing her hiring on the board you know Mar Mary Lou as we all know resigned on March 31st in early April right after this happened I contacted Dennis and I said hey listen I think I've got somebody who would be great for the job just so you know it's my sister-in-law but Dennis we're only we would only hire her if she is the most qualified applicant candidate for this job Dennis raised issues about the familial re relationship. Oh, you know, you can't hire somebody who's your sister. I said, Dennis, I don't really see the problem. You know, I, I, you know, I won't vote on it. Or, I, you know, like, as long as she's the best candidate, don't we want to find the most qualified people? But he raised a, a lot of issues about the relationship and then also accused me of pushing Mary Lou out, that I intentionally pushed her out by not granting health care, even though the majority of the board made that decision. Okay, so I shelved it. I said, you know what? The chairman isn't happy about it. I'm going to put this on the block. I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to do anything. May 25th, we had a board meeting. At the conclusion of that board meeting, Dennis came up to me and said, Peter, we got to get your sister-in-law in. See, if, call her up, call her back, and see if she'll come in and interview. I had dropped it. I had not raised it to another board member. Not one person on this board besides Dennis even knew that she was <coughs> an applicant. But Dennis comes up to me and tells me, call your sister-in-law. Get her in here and interview. So I did. Okay. So our next meeting is basically June 27th, the next time the board meets. Now, Dennis has a change of heart. There's a new applicant that he prefers. Meanwhile, I've already called my sister-in-law. I've told her, you know, the board, I think that, you know, we're going to have you come in and interview. So I presented to the balance of the board at that meeting. Commissioner Laurie says, I don't have a problem with it. Commissioner Rabin, I don't have a problem with it. Commissioner Baker says, you know, it could be an issue if you're voting for your sister-in-law. I said, you know what? If, if you think that's an issue and I could understand it, I will recuse myself if my sister-in-law ever comes up for a vote to be voted into this position. And then all the majority of commissioners, except Dennis, agreed at that point that we should have Jamie interview my sister-in-law. Okay? So Dennis talks about me forcing my sister-in-law. Dennis told me to call her. He came up to me at the meeting. Get her in here. Then I do it. He's had a change of heart, and he's accusing me of being unethical. This is absurd behavior. It is truly absurd behavior. So now we get to our June 27th meeting, and Dennis is, you know, irate. He, he want, he, he's, he's angry that my sister-in-law is in the mix, and he brings up shortly before this meeting this concept of, you know, we cannot hire someone who is an in town, who is, lives out of town, if we have qualified out of town applicants. So your sister in law is disqualified. Now, this is the case, even though before Dennis told me to bring my sister in law to interview, we had received resumes from qualified in, in town applicants who Dennis later voted to hire. He voted to hire them. We had those resumes before he told me to get my sister in law. But at that point, he didn't want those applicants. He decided they were bad for one reason or another. But now that it's my sister-in-law and that he's on this personal agenda to somehow prevent that, he brings up this, this issue of, of the in-town, out-of-town issue. So you know what? The meeting ends. It's a horrible executive session. We're screaming and yelling at each other. We're accusing each other. So I say to the board at the end of that, you know, I asked Dennis, I said, Dennis, you know, is, is this going to be an issue? Are you going to create a smear campaign? Are you going to do this? You know, and I just, that was it. We kind of walked out. I left the meeting. I contacted my sister-in-law. I said, listen, there's an issue with this in-town, out-of-town thing. I think that, you know, this may disqualify you from being considered for the position. And she withdrew. I let most of the commissioners know at that time. I literally was leaving two days later to go to Peru for 10 days. <coughs> and I didn't call Dennis to tell him, but I told others. And upon my return, I told other members of the board, I told the chief, I told the treasurer. So she's been out of the picture for an extended period of time. But again, the, the nerve that this man has to accuse me of being unethical when he, le he comes aside and says, call her, bring her in an interview, and then he's complaining that I've brought her into interview. It is insane decision making. It is erratic, it is irrational, and it is disruptive to this board. Think about the amount of time we have spent on this, okay? More headaches than I ever wanted, and I don't want to be dealing with this. But when somebody kind of impugns your character, when they, when they accuse you of wrongdoing, 
when there's no wrongdoing there whatsoever, it just, it pushes your buttons and you have to fight back. And this is not an isolated incident with this man, okay? I believe that things have changed. There was a time when Dennis and I were on much friendlier terms and I did feel Dennis was doing what was right on behalf of the board. But something has changed in the last year and his decision making has become erratic and it's become uh, waffling, it's become dysfunctional and it has cost us to lose a tremendous amount of time and waste a tremendous amount of district resources. Now I can get into specific examples of major issues where Dennis is fighting hard for this and then reverses himself a short time later. Dennis spearheaded the charge to abolish the assistant chief position. He did that in 2016. Dennis just lobbied the board to reinstate the assistant chief position, okay? He gave all these reasons. It's unnecessary, it's a waste of money, you know, it's an administrative, it's this, that, and the other thing. So now he's, he's, he's leading the charge. Dennis has gone on and on about how important it is, and we're gonna get to this topic in a second, how valuable the law firm that currently serves the district is to the district, how they've won all these cases, how they're the smartest lawyers in New York State, and we've done so well. Well, guess what? Dennis has said this the last couple of years. He said it when we voted to hire him in January. At the end of our last meeting, Dennis told them that he was, they were, he was going to call the Bar Association on him, no, that he said you were going to call the Bar Association on him. No. He told them that he was going to fire them as our attorneys, okay? And he said that he was going to contact the Attorney General. I and and the lawyers, Dennis, you had the floor. Him, Dennis, you had the floor. Him. I have the floor now. Come on, I let you Keep speak. You okay, right. so this is what he's done. Guess what? Our attorneys have resigned. Our fantastic attorneys, because Dennis, thinks they're the world's greatest thing. And I tend to, I agree with that. I think they are fantastic. But now, in executive session, because we've passed a, a resolution that hasn't even been implemented yet, that Dennis doesn't agree with, he basically threatens to bring legal action and to fire these attorneys. And now, they're leaving, and they ain't coming back, okay? And again, there is example after example of these 180s in decision making and it is just too disruptive to this board. We are wasting time on nonsense because somebody has a personal agenda and it has to stop. It has to stop. Okay. Now, as far as your um, decision to not promote your sister, in you know, I should say, I'm, I shouldn't, I, you know, somebody said to me, the sister-in-law, and I said, no, his, it's his wife's sister, the wife's sister. Well, that's his sister-in-law. Yeah, it could have been the brothers too, but in this case, it's the wife's sister. Um, and so, on July 7th, happy to meet with anyone if others feel we should. My short list is, and then there's one name, one name, and then the sister-in-law. That's Peter's short list. Um, so. That's right. I, I thought she was the most qualified, and I thought two other candidates right. were in the hunt, and this is before Dennis raised the town law issue. And again, just to be clear, Dennis had instructed me to contact her and have her come in and meet with Jamie and right. the board. Right. You did. I don't want to turn this into a debate. I'm trying to keep it civilized. But Dennis, I'm trying to keep say it civil too. Truth. But He's Dennis, truth. did that happen? Look in the camera and say, did you tell me? I thought, well, let me tell you about the candidate we had come in. Dennis, so did you? Let me please answer the question. I'm going to answer your question. You're not going to interrogate me. Interrogate me. So here's what happened. On June 27th, we had a woman come in who is Fordham undergraduate with ac academic distinction, Fordham graduate, recent graduate, had numerous jobs of, of related fields. And so we had a double Fordham, as our treasurer is a double Fordham. So we had a double Fordham, town resident, uh, who presented, I thought, wonderfully. And I thought our search was over. But she lives in town. So we'd have to hire her before we went out of town. That turned into a very ugly board meeting, as Mr. Inkledon just said. To me, the woman was an automatic hire. I've had numerous years in business, running a fairly successful one. Um, and from that moment on, things kind of unraveled. So I came and said to Jamie, what's the chances we could hire this young woman that we just interviewed? And what is the job description for a fire district manager if we could slot that? We looked at the job description for fire district manager. We realized you needed two years experience within a fire district office, and that decision had to go off the table because the wife's sister wouldn't have the two years experience of in that position, so therefore she wasn't gonna fit that slot. That's what the change in about was. 
Peter makes it like I offered her a job. I didn't offer her a job. No, I never said you offered her a job. Okay, I said you, you asked me to have her come in and meet with Jamie and the board. You said you wanted to interview her to find out that. if she... Yes, she did. If yes, she did. Then okay, she did. Okay, so now, here's wait, the... Wait, just, just so we're clear, because now it's going back and forth. Are you saying... Peter's saying that you asked him to bring his, this woman in. Are you saying you brought her in for secretary or for fire district manager? I don't think I brought her. I have to read really the look at the email. I do most everything by email. I don't think I have any emails. Says, and that's the other thing. If anybody's confused about this whole conversation we're having, there is plenty of emails. Emails you can FOIL, which is the Freedom Information Act law, which is Section 89 in New York State Public Offices law, which I think everybody has a duty to know and send the old FOIL request in. It's basically sending a letter saying, hey, give me your emails and I'm doing it under FOIL and we'll send you all the stuff. And we have an email address, FOIL at Eastchester FD, where you can get all these emails and read them for yourself. But in any case, um, I don't know exactly the, the, the parlance, whether I asked them to or not to ask them to, <laughs> but... Well, what, well, what position were you... It would be fire district manager. Can I... Uh, I, I listen, was I, there town. was somebody who was there who heard exactly what you asked, and we could... You know, I, I hate dragging other people into our dispute, Dennis, but you asked me to have her come in and interview for the secretary position, and you did it I, in front of others. I, I, well, I wouldn't have done it with Mrs. Dobbins, well, I shouldn't say her name, with the, with the resume from the from the double double Fordham out there. Dennis, the Dennis, double Fordham I, I think, blew the resume out, th out think, of the window. I think you're being dishonest right now. Okay. And, well, and, I, and I will and I will I will add this. Listen, uh, you know, uh, again, I hate doing this because it's we're now talking about you know people in their lives. The woman Dennis is talking about was a lovely person, and had very strong skills. She was also someone who I and a majority of the board felt was vastly overqualified for the position and wouldn't stay in it for a long period of time. A recent graduate with a bachelor's and a master's from a top university, okay, taking a 20 hour a week job with no room for advancement. Because, no, that's not true. well, Dennis, it's true. We have a treasurer in place that we like and who is going to maintain those responsibilities. So now the board made a rational decision that we felt someone was not going to stay in the job long. We were already banging our heads against the wall for an extended period, and yet that set you off. You wanted to hire this woman, and then when a majority of the board expressed that opinion, which is completely rational and which you can go online and Google, but most human resource professionals will attest to the fact that it is not a good idea to hire someone who's vastly overqualified for a secretarial role. And yet, we, we made that honest assessment and you could not accept it. And so you went on a personal agenda to, to smear Anthony, to smear me, to smear, to smear anyone who was in your path. And you've done this consistently. Something has changed with you in the last six to nine months and it is it is really hurting this board and it is hurting the district. And it has to stop. It has to stop. Okay, now let's talk about civil service positions that are available to us at the time in Jamie's email. Um, we have the typical career positions. We have attorney, um, fire district manager. We have a mechanic. We have a physician, secretary treasurer, secretary of the board of fire commissioners, a stenographer, and a fire district treasurer so uh, there was no slot had we if we had slots available the fellow we hired as a consultant would have been an employee in 2013 I don't want to belabor this point I just don't feel like running through the mud with all this stuff for what it is I mean it's a 20 hour a week seven thirty dollar an hour job um, that I think should turn into a full-time job you, you, I think it's going to be a full-time job this by spending 20 minutes going through your rationale and how you're right and how Peter is is, uh, is conflicted and how Anthony is conflicted and so there's no there's no choice but to defend ourselves and to point out that, that your accusations are without merit they are baseless and, uh, and you, listen your, you've, you've that's said in your opinion. You, 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 well, that is totally you know in your what opinion. that's why I, I, I've, I said that's at the last meeting and I'll say again you know, like, I, I don't recommend that people foil the district. That's more your gig. You know, I don't want to waste Jamie's time on this nonsense. and We're already doing it in this meeting. But if they do, it's, it's, it's plain for everyone to see. Everything I've said here tonight is true. Okay. 
So hopefully people will foil the district and they will get copies of the documents, read them themselves, and they can figure out what they want to, you know, figure out who's representing them the best. And that's, you know, because that's what it really comes down to, who's representing the taxpayers the best and looking out for their interests is, is what I kind of think is what people care about, which is if you look at, we're going to have tonight the budget discussion. I'm going to try to segue into the budget discussion and segue out of this discussion. Um, if you look at our budget tonight, we're going to try to come in for the fourth year in a row under the tax cap, which is uh, Ms. Hengstrom is going to be leading the charge on that. Uh, so do you want to go for the budget right now? Would that be a good? Are you going to follow? I, you know, I, I thought the agenda was first to talk about the law firm, and then we get into the budget. Well, I don't know. OK, it. I'll talk about the law firm. We'll just go with uh, another one. We'll go from one unpleasantry to another one. Um, the, the law firm resigned on Sunday morning, September 2nd, at about 9.30 in the morning. Um, so they will stay on to handle our existing cases. The default is they'll stay on and handle our existing cases until we find another law firm or they agree with the other law firm to keep the, some of the existing cases. And then we're going to be in the search mode for a, a new law firm. Is there much more discussion than that? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. Uh, the firm, when they sent the letter, uh, was clear that they are doing it, uh, they're resigning due to recent developments, okay? Uh, the only recent development there was was that at the conclusion of our, our last interaction with them, uh, the chairman threatened to fire them, contact the attorney general and the bar association, uh, and then followed up with several emails uh, questioning uh, their legal authority. Uh, for the first time uh, since we've been dealing with this law firm, uh, the senior partner was included in the email chain. Never saw his name before, but the partner that we deal with was so alarmed by Dennis's accusations and behavior that he started to include the managing partner in the email chain. No, I will also let, I hey, I have the floor, Dennis, I have the floor, okay? Uh, they also told me that this is the first time. They represent 130 fire districts, their general counsel, to dozens the first time they have ever resigned, okay, from, from basically providing legal services to a client, the first time. And again, this is because the chairman threatened to fire them and bring legal action against them. And that's what we're dealing with. Now, I'll clarify. At the end of the last, at, we had a special meeting on August 31st, called by two days notice on a holiday weekend, uh, called by Mr. Rabin and Mr. Ingladon. The purpose of that meeting, um, part of it, Mr. Ingledon came with a pre-written statement of basically how what a rotten person I am. But other than that, um, it was a resolution where we appointed uh, a commissioner to be the point person for all legal matters, and then they appointed that person who it to be. So Mr. Ingledon at the end of the meeting was appointed to be the only person to communicate with fire district council, not the chief not the treasurer. If we had a FOIL officer, it wouldn't be the FOIL officer. It's only Mr. Inkledon who can communicate with counsel. I told uh, counsel. Unless I tell counsel they can deal directly with any of those parties. Right, unless, yeah. unless Mr. Mr. Inkledon allows us to uh, talk to those people. The person voting on these, on, uh, who approved this, is Mr. Laurie on the end of the table here and Mr. Ink Mr. Rabin on the other side of the table. Yeah, I was happy to do it. And Mr. Laurie, is right now his the volunteers, which he's closely associated with, are waiting for a contempt of court motion to come back on them disclosing financial records. So now the person who's the point person for all those legal matters has been told so you can't talk to the lawyer. Just, just so I'm clear, are you saying that I'm colluding with Anthony because Anthony is subject oh. to the same rules? He can't contact counsel no, either. I'm just saying Not, neither could Commissioner right. Raven. Everybody's in the same boat. Right, right. So right. I, I'm just curious. Are you suggesting? that somehow I'm colluding with Anthony to somehow no, do something I'm not with saying, the volunteers? I'm saying or if I Anthony would have abstained from voting, that resolution wouldn't have passed. He could have personally easily said, I'm abstaining because I'm closely associated with one of the matters that are currently pending in court. Mr. Rabin, on the other hand, could have simply said, I'm abstaining because my employer is bringing a legal action against the fire district, and therefore maybe I should abstain. He had that right to do that. He could have done that. He chose not to. Mr. Lorry chose not to. So um, I find it to be questionable 
how board members chose not to abstain and they passed a resolution that limits the fire district's ability to communicate my ability as a member of the board with 12 years experience as chairman to communicate with council. I think council, uh, rightfully so, got nervous and said, wait a second, I got a guy on the other end of the phone who's gonna start making phone calls and saying, how is this possible? And so they just said, and they also, on Sunday morning at nine o'clock, an hour before they resigned, Sunday morning, holiday weekend, we send a letter off, at least Peter did, to one of the attorneys at the firm requesting that they provide him with a resolution Tuesday morning. So it may be it was like, hey, this is a troublesome account. I'm getting emails on Sunday mornings of a holiday weekend. I don't need it. Goodbye. So that's how I would read it. And I believe I, I said in the email, Tuesday's business or Monday's business, whatever it was, email, it was, it was Tuesday's business, email, and it was to, to a motion about either the secretarial hire or something else. So that, that's not unusual. We send, you know, and I, I made it clear that I didn't expect them to be working on this stuff on a holiday weekend. You know, Dennis has, has brought up this motion, and I explained why we did this in the last meeting, but I'll explain it again. You know, we spent roughly $180,000 last year on Coughlin and Gerhardt on legal services. We're on pace to do a little bit less than that this year. It's a lot of money. Uh, I think we want to make sure that we control our legal costs. We want to make sure that there's less duplication, that every thought that comes into some commissioner's head isn't just sent directly to the, to the, le to the law firm without first checking with other commissioners to see if somebody has the answer in-house. To me, it just makes sense. I was also concerned that Dennis was using the law firm to pursue a personal agenda, which he had done at a, at a meeting that we had had the previous month, okay? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but he was asking them specific legal information that he was going to use to somehow try to smear, smear others on the board. What are you talking so, about? So, you can't so, say that and then so, go down that road. Come on, come on. Dennis, you, you, you asked them whether or not you could t force a vote in executive session, okay, and then release the minutes of that vote without board approval because executive session minutes but you the only reason to do that was to be able to release minutes of an executive session okay without the board voting to approve those minutes so i viewed that as a personal agenda so i raised my concerns with the law firm i said listen this is what i think i'm concerned about this i'm concerned about these other things the law firm came back immediately and said peter we understand your concerns and I'll tell you what we're doing with other fire districts to address them. And they then provided the motion that we ultimately adopted. It applies to Anthony, it applies to Stu, it applies to Stephen, it applies to Dennis. Before it was even enacted, Dennis is threatening to fire the attorneys, to pursue legal action against them, claiming that he doesn't have access to counsel. We haven't even enacted it yet. This is coming out of the executive session. So, you know, like, it's just, it's, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just I want, want I, with this. well, Dude, I just want the board, the board and the public know I'm not up here to represent just the volunteers. I was elected here to represent the people of this town, including the village of Bronxville and the village of Tuckahoe. I'm not here to say I'm a volunteer, so I'm going to represent the volunteers and Forget about the public. I'm not here for that. And don't let Dennis bully you people to tell you that. I was a volunteer since 1973, and I'm proud of that. But I'm not here just to represent the volunteers or the paid personnel or the secretaries or anybody. I'm here to represent the taxpayers of this, this town. And that's what I was elected here for. So, Dennis, stop telling the people that I'm all for the volunteers. I don't like that. You've accused me of a lot of things. Okay, as far as the, um, as far as the, and I, I know Peter was very upset that in public officer's law, section 189, for people who, who read that stuff, um, allows minutes to be taken in an executive session of a vote. Only the vote is recorded. No conversation. You're not allowed to record the conversation. Mark the conversation. You're only supposed to record the vote. The, this, this whole hiring process came to a conclusion, if you want to call it that, at the August 8th meeting when we took that vote and got some commissioners on record as to what they want to do. And you pub you publicized it. And I have to publicize it by law within five days of an executive session meeting. Yeah, I, was even, I, was, I was even stopped on the street by individuals saying how I voted. 
you they're supposed you, to tell you, them. You it's forced, vote in executive you session forced the vote, which we've never done in executive session since I've been on the board. You, you consult the attorneys. You did it to be able to release minutes without without approval from the rest of the board. And the only reason why those minutes were unvarnished is because I realized, we realized, the balance of the majority of this board realized what you were up to, and we, we threw a flag on the field and said, hey, we got a problem here. Look what this guy's trying to pull. And we said, we want to see those minutes before they go out. We do not want you to put out your well, own there was version nothing wrong because with the you. Minutes. The minutes were. Dennis, you can't Dennis, get to there them. was nothing wrong with the minutes because we had put you on notice that we wanted to see them, even though you planned to put them out without getting approval from the board. There, so you got, you tried to play cute and you got caught. And then what happened is the majority of the board decided that we were going to try to put an end to that and also save the district money by controlling, you know, by uh, making sure we're prudently, you know, spending money on legal resources. So you're saying There's nothing wrong with about, that. You're saying this whole legal maneuvering is about a commissioner complying with public office's law to release minutes within five days of a board meeting as required by public office's law. And the minutes only recorded the vote and no conversation. So that is, they were as crisp and clear as they can be. Dennis. And also, just let me finish, New York State Public Office's law does not require minutes to be approved. And if you don't believe, grieve me, go call Bob Friedman, Dennis. New York State it's Office of Open practice. Government. It's practice. We vote to approve minutes. I still have the floor. Let me finish, okay? I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be done now because I've wasted enough time on this and I can just tell anybody that if, if Dennis is accusing someone of something, chance that he's telling the truth, chance that it's right, but there's an equal chance that he's making it up just to just to smear somebody. And, you know, I I personally feel like I had to give this full throated defense and bring this all out because when somebody accuses you of something, you know, you, you have <clears throat> to defend yourself. But I'm done defending myself for tonight. I'll continue with the business and hopefully at some point, you know, Dennis will, will you know, see the light. yeah, well, see the light. I know. I, what I've learned out of this, and I think this is entertaining. Actually, I do. I think it's kind of <laughs> interesting. I think it's entertaining over a fact that we got upset because a board member complied with New York State Public Office's law and supplied minutes to a meeting within five days as law required from a resident asking me what happened at that meeting. I find that a little bizarre. I also find bizarre that we make judgment about hiring people by their marital status. If you're single versus married, we'll make a determination as to whether we're going to hire you or not. Because, whoa, if she's single now, well, she might get married, and if she gets married, it's going to cost us more. That is a no-no, and we shouldn't go there, and we shouldn't what, what, have that discussion. What are you, what what are you, are you saying? About? What, who, who, who I heard that earlier. I heard it earlier that I, said, I heard earlier I heard earlier the justification for not hire, for justification of the cost for the health care for, for the part-time secretary who is our employee would change dramatically if she got married, so therefore that was a consideration in the back of your mind. That is a clear violation of federal That's law. That's not true. What he said was that the information that you're speaking of was not advised to him during that point in time. No, that is said what he clear. said. We'll no, no, he, no. Didn't. he said that you had information concerning her personally that was not communicated to the rest of the board members. That is what he said. No, and yes. And he did say that. He did say He's, that. But now it's a yes, Dennis. Dennis it was yeah, a no well, until I said I, yes very I, loudly. I made it clear that her getting married didn't, it, my decision to grant her health care was based on the fact that we had offered her the position two months earlier with the understanding that it didn't include health care. I was trying to make the point that you're saying it's only an eight thousand dollar expense to the district my point being is that it could end up being if we set a precedent if people are it could end up being a much more costly but th that is a fact that's that's not you know that no, didn't include my got married my, if you said if it got married it could Dennis, us a lot my more. decision to not grant her health care was based solely on the fact that two months earlier we hired her with the understanding that health care was not part of her compensation package. So, I, you know, I don't know. What, what businesses do you, you know, have you worked in where, you know, things change that abruptly? 
uh, we've had businesses where we closed hedge funds and they changed abruptly. Yeah. Every single um, time you look at a meeting on so, YouTube um, or whatever else and Mary Lou or Jamie were hired, whether it was correct or not, they were hired with health care nice ship permitting. Correct. That's correct. correct. The board, however, was not offering health care for correct. these positions, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that, so wording, what's that wording does cause some hostility because there was a miscommunication because Mrs. Palero back in the day. It doesn't matter about her. Yeah. This, this is just a different person. I know that. There's no set precedent no, from but that. We were hiring a part-time individual. Right, right, right. But my point was she was the health care administrator that did a survey once, and her guidelines were more liberal than let's say the okay board but our guidelines or your guidelines as a board in 2016 hired her nice ship permitting nice ship doesn't say that somebody who's part-time is supposed to get health care correct they'll they have a guideline saying if you're eligible but that doesn't mean the board's going to give it to you correct. I think we're saying the same thing so what we're doing is we're arguing about something that the board do wasn't even responsible to give what Peter is saying and I do agree and I do support is that if we set a precedent to start allowing part-time employees in this fire district health care. It's not something we can just back out of in five years from now because we feel like it, like maybe dissolving a position or changing the duties. Part-time employees in municipal government or tax districts, whatever you want to call the fire district, is not commonplace, and we shouldn't enter that precedent, especially with rising costs. That's my Okay, so you want to move into the budget, or I have well, this? I, I have a, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have a quick question about the the law firm uh, issue. They represent a couple of us uh, who have been named individually in um, an action by a former. I don't even know how to qualify him. I don't know how to qualify him either. Person. Person who had some work in some capacity with the district. The entire board has not been named. That is correct. Uh, well, the fire board in generic has been named, but individuals. I was named. I was named. You named. That fellow over there was named. All right. We were all named. Who wasn't? Okay. Did you get everybody? Okay. No, I, I just want to make sure. So I will be contacting the law firm because they represent me. And they yeah. mentioned that today in executive session that they will contact each member individually as their name. Exactly. They, they, no, they just, said that in writing the day after. No, no, I'm not yeah. accusing it. I'm just saying we're just, I don't want this to come up again at a future meeting and spend too much time. An ungodly amount of time okay. arguing. Okay. Right. Uh, can we move to the budget at this point in time and we'll do that and then we'll worry about this other agenda items as we move down? Sure. Jamie, because you might have to go home to the children, child. It is now 10 o'clock. Do you know where your mommy is? All right. Um, so tonight I'm presenting the proposed budget for 2018. Um, as I think uh, okay, Senator already it. mentioned, um, the budget as prepared uh, tonight, we're showing a 0% tax increase. Um, and really the goal tonight is to um, have discussion, get any comments, uh, recommendations from the board. Um, so that we can get a budget approved prior to our next meeting, which is October 17th. We need to um, present the final budget that's already been approved for public comment at that time. Um, so, uh, as I said, it is a 0% increase. Um, it did take some work to, to get there. Um, I will say, you know, I put together a list of budget highlights uh, that, that was available up front or for anyone who wants a copy. So uh, we were faced again no. this year. Um, it, it was in, it was underneath another pile. Um, again this year with some uh, increasing costs that we don't have any control over. Um, the largest of these, I think it's already been mentioned, is that uh, NYSHIP has informed us of a potential 9.6% increase on health care. Um, we also know uh, we have a scheduled increase uh, in salaries of two and a quarter percent uh, based on the CBA. Um, and while uh, New York State pension rates went down, which was, which was nice, uh, you know, obviously our, our salaries are going up and the pace of how New York State is calculating that has changed. So we probably will see that remain static. Um, so like I said, you know, to, to remain at zero percent, um, we did have to really put of pen to paper and look at where um, we could uh, cut some cushion out of the budget. I think the idea this year as we were working on it was um, 
you know, to really uh, look at what our actual costs have been, um, but also considering, um, you know, giving the new chief uh, ability to, to spend um, where he needs to. Uh, um, and also, you know, we, we have had many meetings where we've talked about the surplus that we've built up over the last few years. So uh, we're really looking at 2018 as the year to, uh, you know, dig into there and, and start using the funds we've accumulated um, before we, you know, continue to raise taxes. So that's, um, that's how the budget is currently presented. Um, you will see there's quite a few line items where we've made adjustments to, to, get, us, to get ourselves there. Um, you know, the largest is that we did remove the contingency expense, um, which was a line item that we've, we've had in there historically um, that was sort of, uh, you know, a, an extra, you know, place where we might have had some cushion and, and that, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that historically. Um, you know, and it's important to know that we, if there are any expenses we're not anticipating currently, um, that might be another reason that we're looking uh, to use our, our excess in 2018 with the budget as presented. Okay. Um, Stu, do you have any comments? Yeah. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for working on this. I know we had a lot of conversations over the last few months about different things. I think this is an excellent budget. I think it's an appropriate budget. I think with the sizable reserve that we have, it's definitely well worth it for our residents to see us start spending money that we have already collected before we start collecting more on top of what we're already expected to collect again. Um, it's very straight and to the point. I think that it would be more appropriate for us to begin to spend money and reinvest it back into the community before we start asking for more money on top of our operating expenses. But there is still room in here for us to be able to cover ourselves properly. So, Jamie, thank you. I think this is a great draft. I think it's a great, great strike at it. So let's hold. Jamie, um, my comments would be, um, I don't think we're gonna, next year we're going to run deficit. We'll probably run flat year over year, from my guess, from this budget from year over year. We're not going to end up with any excess capital or excess cash. You know, if you were a business, you're not going to be running profitable. Right. You'll be running pretty close to what your, what your guesswork is, which means, um, four years in a row under the cap cap and you have ta you have the health care went up nine percent and you have you say two and three quarters for fireman's salary but real it's really two and three quarters because 20 25 percent is pension liability yeah, that's true so you're really two and three quarters increase so if you have a two and three quarter increase for 60 percent of your budget nine percent for probably eight percent for health care right and so these are not sustainable numbers going flat year over year so next year the people should not be shocked if they get a you know, if we end up over the cap or something, that's all I'm saying, that, that next year we can expect to um, see a larger increase than flat. I think next year we'll be able to look at possibly needing to do some type of increase because we would have shown that we're reinvesting this excess money back into the community. And I think then it would make more sense for us to say if we have to increase, we've already reinvested money. Maybe we're still waiting on these two trucks. I was hoping that tonight we would have those those out those specs but we don't but we'll be buying trucks in 2018 since we didn't buy them in 2017 and Chester Heights did not start until about a month ago rather than in April like at the reorganization meeting I think 2018 will be a good year for us to see uh, us uphold our end of the bargain of collecting money and then reinvesting it I agree with that sure. so Jamie uh, any guys have any questions or any I do want to say one more thing too with Jamie uh, we had this discussion, I think, two meetings ago. We'll also be looking to enact some kind of capital plan moving forward 2018 where we'll properly designate a lot of this money towards specific purchases to show what we intend to do. Yep. And uh, I think that'll be great. And I think the chief is going to talk about something later concerning the idea of upgrading communications in the buildings. I think that's something we should definitely take a look at, especially with Chester Heights being the first one to actually have interior but maybe some of the other houses that we can that have already been worked on, we can start looking at potential vendors to see what we need to afford that. Do you have a resolution for the budget? No. So what do we do? What do we do? I don't know. We normally have a two-page resolution. Well, you know, I handle resolutions on the secretary, the chief's discretionary authority. At just assume you would join it. I can do it. 
Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Jamie. So, uh, if we pass this budget, we cannot increase the budget between now and October 17th, October 17th being the date the state requires us to have a meeting. Uh, I think since we're not going over the tax cap, we generally pass a tax cap resolution. I don't have the tax cap resolution in front of me, and we normally read a resolution. So I think what we'll do is we'll adopt this budget as it sits here in front of us with the numbers as presented, and then we'll um, have a more formal resolution at the October 17th meeting. Does that make sense? That's good to me. And we'll take this and post it to the website tomorrow. If it, wor if it works, it was our job. We, we did it. If it's messed up, it's all Jamie's fault. Right. <laughs> right. I think we'll be fine. We okay. just have to have a resolution available right. at the next meeting because we have the tax cap numbers you have to submit to the tax okay. cap people. Yes. You said it that. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So can I get a motion? Stu, do you have a motion? Motion, yes. I'll second it. Okay. Stu has a motion to adopt the current budget, the proposed 2018 budget which the total fire district expenditures are $16,895,725.75. The proposed tax increase is zero, provided that the certiorities and the town's tax roll is identical year over year. If the town gets a series of certiorari wins, then you get a tax increase even though we didn't raise your taxes. That's how it works because you have to split the cost over a smaller pie. So um, while we're doing a flat spending over year, it doesn't guarantee that we're going to end up with a flat tax increase depending on the certiorities. Dennis, I want to ask a question. The chief's th numbers are all the same all the way to 2018. Is that correct? Well, they're going to be because the chief doesn't have a CBA. They give them an increase. So we'll have to worry about that problem uh, at the time we talk to the chief. The chief in, a, in about uh, 20 days will be a permanent chief. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe he's if he has his hand up and says yes. Um, okay, like so. Cross fingers, Chief. That's. So, okay, so we had, I'll call the board. Mr. Laurie? Aye. Mr. Ingledon? Aye. Mr. Raven? Aye. Mr. Baker? Aye. And I'll say aye. Thank you, Jamie. We'll pass that budget, and uh, that's okay. all good. Great, great work, Jamie. Thank Very you. Very good work, and thank you, Stu. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Next item. Peter, do you have anything on there you want to nail so we can just move this along? Uh, Secretary? Yeah, do that. Okay. Uh, we uh, have identified uh, a candidate that we would like uh, to hire. Her name is uh, Lisa Luc Lucarelli Gutierrez. Uh, she has uh, been an investigator for 12 years, most recently with the MTA. Uh, she has a uh, BA uh, in criminal justice from Iona. Uh, she's uh, got a uh, great personality and uh, a very strong skill set that I think is, is going to really be a, a tremendous asset for the district. So uh, I would like to make a motion to hire Lisa for the secretary position. Okay, just read the resolution. It's easier than do it that way. Sure. Uh, a motion to appoint Lisa Luca, Lucarelli Gutierrez as a secretary to the Board of Fire Commissioners for the remainder of the calendar year 2017 on the following terms. Salary of $30 per hour, expected 20 hours per week, not eligible for health insurance, pension eligibility, sick leave is required by law, two weeks paid vacation, no longevity or personal days, overtime is required by law, and no paid holidays. Somebody have a second on that? I'll second it. I'll call the board. Mr. Laurie? Aye. Mr. Raven? Aye. Mr. Ingledon? Aye. Mr. Baker? Aye. And I'll uh, say, I'm going to pass, and, or because I, th I thought we had other candidates I would have preferred, so I'm just going to say no. Okay? Are you and I'll leave no? it at are that. Are you voting no? Or I'm voting no. Okay. No. I'll just I just want no. the record to be clear. Yeah, no. Whatever and, you want to do. And I think she's perfectly fine. It's just that I would have had a, uh, I would have had a, a, a more... I would have had a, a different choice, so I'll just do that. Um, when is our hiring day? Well, yeah, effective when? We need to do that. <coughs> uh, effective, uh, you know, I believe a week from. Uh, give, it, give it a date. Yeah, all right. Today's the 7th on Monday. Jamie, when's your next pay period? Sixteenth, so she should start sixteenth. Uh, the eighteenth would be the ideal date for her to start. Is she capable of starting that date? I, I don't know. I 
Yeah. On the honorary she, after honorary yeah, after honorary, honorary after, 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 yeah, honorary yeah, after yeah. September 18th. Okay. Yep. So honorary after September 18th, she can pick it. Okay. And you just can jet that into the resolution. She's going to be typing it up anyway. Um, Chief's discretionary authority. Go there. Okay. Uh, we uh, as most people uh, may be aware, we're uh, working on a uh, roof replacement at our Chester Heights firehouse. Uh, the project is going along quite well. Uh, however, as uh, you know, most projects of that uh, size, uh, we often have issues where we get a request for a, a change order from the contractor uh, to do you know, some work that was unforeseen when the project was initially designed. Uh, this board meets once a month, and while we can have special meetings, sometimes it's difficult to uh, convene the board to quickly to, to handle decisions on, on things like change orders, which a lot of times can be relatively minor and, and low in dollar price. Uh, I think the board, uh, gener you know, uh, unanimously uh, trusts the chief in his judgment and would like to give him some discretionary authority. Uh, to respond to change orders for this project. Uh, so I am proposing uh, that we do that. A uh, motion to uh, grant Chief Tween uh, discretionary authority up to $25,000. Uh, so I'll, I'll just read the motion. Uh, motion to establish the change order authority of the fire chief on the Chester Heights roof replacement project to an amount not to exceed $25,000 in total when such limit is reached or such project is completed, the authority ends, unless reestablished by the Board of Fire Commissioners. Second. I'll second. Oh, you got a second. You yeah. second it. Baker seconds it. Mr. Lurie? Aye. Mr. Aye. Baker. I mean, Mr. I'll say aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Okay. Next one. Don't make, don't make me regret that, Chief. Okay. Um, we have a couple other items here. Um, discuss We'll skip the code of ethics discussion, and uh, we'll just skip the health care because that's sort of left over. And we'll skip. Um, I have an item on here to discuss Supervisor Calavito's shared services suggestion. Um, there was a meeting at Westchester County where um, the governor asked the county asked the county executives to come out with a shared services agreement. Uh, the town supervisor submitted. Uh, quote, to take over the finances of the East Chester Fire District. My only comment on that would be, as you heard all this discussion tonight, our support staff at the East Chester Fire District for doing all our front office work is Jamie Henstrom, who works 17 hours a week, and the woman we just hired to work approximately 17 or 20 hours a week. What was it, 20 hours a week? Yes. 20 hours a week. So 37 hours a week, we have employees doing all the business work of the fire district. It would be hard for me to believe that town government or any other government could do it more effectively than we are currently doing it. And there would be any kind of cost savings whatsoever to merge over our finance department of the fire district. I just don't see it. Um, so we also, for our radio systems, the way we buy oil, the way we buy communi the way our communications work, we've tried to study this years over many times over the years and we haven't been able to find a way to do any more shared services than we're doing not that there isn't any but we're, we haven't and if somebody comes up with an idea we can willing to listen but right now that's as much as i know about the idea the supervisor floated well and just for the but, record that wasn't the only thing that was floated it was oh yeah you know taking over services from the village of tuckahoe mm -hmm. and the village of bronxville right and office staff and things like that but and the, a mutual the, mechanic right, right. Isn't that on yeah. something like that and, and, but this is uh, this is the only part that relates to town -wide us repair shop right town wide repair shop wouldn't be the worst the right. problem that all the towns are having the town of east chester the village of bronxville village of tucko all have the identical problem when it comes to repairs of trucks including fire trucks there's no physical space for them really to have a, a facility go into play right. unless we help buy one or yeah build, or build one or build one or right. take the back of evac maybe and do it with that or something. But EVAC, shared, right? too deep. Yeah. shared services. Behind, uh, the highway department, there could be some space there. Yeah, I don't know that area, but yeah. Shared services does work. Just, for example, go to Scarsdale. They take care of all the highway. They take care of all the school buses, all the school cars, all the village cars. 
the school maintenance trucks, and they all work together with purchasing the gas together, get their gas together. We, get, we share the gas. The gas you share. They also get the salt together, so it does work. Don't think it doesn't work. They do all the mechanical work, everything. Scarsdale has been doing it for over 20 years. No, we're they not. take care of the fire department trucks also, and the fire vehicles, cars, everything. Um, what else do we have in there? I have another item on the agenda, and then we have the chief. You want to give your report? We kind of skipped over you over there in the penalty box. He's doing a double minor for roughing. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening, Chief. Activity for the month of August, uh, 282 alarms, 11 fire-related, 168 EMS-related, and mutual aid was given one time to a third alarm fire in Yonkers. Uh, the sta Station 4 roofing project is moving along uh, very nicely. Um, tomorrow, Station 4 will be used as a primary voting place. I didn't bring them. The uh, contractors have uh, provided their construction fencing, so it will not be in the way. The public will have access to Station 4 tomorrow, and the Board of Elections are paying for a monitor or a security guard to be there to assure that nobody trips on the apparatus floor steel plates. Uh, the firefighters also have uh, numerous cones and caution tape. They're going to caution off that area so nobody's walking across the plates, so it'll be less of a tripping hazard. Um, the refrigerator for Station 4 has been ordered and is scheduled to be delivered on Wednesday. The total purchase price is $498.17, payable by check on delivery. After checking the July 17, 2017 commissioner's meeting, I realized that the motion was to spend $400 on the refrigerator. However, when Mr. Inkladon voted, he did state that he was fine with spending $500 on the refrigerator. So I believe Commissioner Lori uh, purchased it with that in mind that the um, refrigerator, uh, that he spent $498 on it. So either we have to cancel it and return, or, you know, tell them not to deliver it, or I guess the board could vote to spend $498.17, but we need a decision before Wednesday so we can tell PC Richard to not come. Um, you want to just I, deal I, with that I, right I now? To yeah, I'll make a motion to amend the, amend the, the, to increase the, amount the, the original. To allow to yeah. go to $498.17. Yeah. Under okay. Rule's order, okay, I'll yeah. make that motion. Second. second. I don't, we don't think we need a resolution on that. You can just do okay. it. Okay, very right. good. And that amount is in tonight's warrant, so if you approve to pay the bills, the check will be authorized too. Uh, yep. Vehicle and I firehouse maintenance okay. continues through the use of outside that. vendors. Fire prevention and code enforcement activities continue with numerous plan reviews as we have many construction projects ongoing. Captain Pinaval has forwarded a proposal for Municity this Software. Way. The uh, village of Bronxville and the town of Eastchester building departments use that software for their uh, construction projects, their um, building permits, and we would like the fire inspector to have access to those plans, uh, drawings, uh, blueprints. Um, so we would like for the fire inspector to be approved to sign up for the municipality software to be able to coordinate with the East Chester and Bronxville building departments. I'm not sure if Tuckahoe is getting it or if they just use a different software platform, but it will allow um, the villages of Bronxville and the town of East Chester to look at our fire inspections and the fire prevention uh, reports or if there's any violations outstanding, which they have requested access to. Um, so that's something that I would recommend the board approved. Um, there is money in the budget for 2017 for computer software and computers, so there's no additional money needs to be set aside for it. I believe uh, that Jamie had forwarded the proposals to the commissioners separately, either yesterday or earlier right. today. Right, so I don't think there's any, uh, for me, uh, there's no objection to those guys. The question we have is we may need to get them some Apple or iPads because it works best with tablets, right? I, it works. The mobile platform is easier to use with uh, tablets. You know, computers, laptops are a little more expensive than tablets. If they need to sit down and do a lengthy report, they can go to their office and they have the desktop version. So they will have the desktop version, but we're also putting in for three mobile platforms, which would be Captain Pinaval, uh, Firefighter Vitarello, and myself. I would like access to, you know, if we have plans or projects or something, maybe access them during a fire, you know, if it's a larger building. 
Um, so I thought it would be good if I also got access to the Municity software. So how, how much is this all together we're talking about? Uh, like uh, the proposals right like here. Like twenty two hundred bucks or something like that. I think it was about twenty five hundred, three thousand, something like that. For the first year. And not including the purchase of the pads. So I pay fifty second. All right, so I'm sure you're not getting picked up. It's fifty six hundred for the initial uh, <coughs> leg, and then it's how much I'm on. Okay. And how much is it every year thereafter? Twelve hundred, and then we have to buy the hardware. Which we have, they have computers in their office already, and we've applied for a grant for three iPads um, to utilize this software. How much is, I mean, we won't know about the grant until uh, so December. We're talking about three, uh, maybe three thousand dollars maximum, I would guess. That's yeah, just for so for the iPads. So I, think it's, you know, I think it's a great tool right. to have. And yeah, yeah. Chief, I have a question. Sure. Uh, with this software, I know you mentioned that Bronxville and, and the town of Eastchester uses it. This means that these um, these officers and yourself will have access to all the updates they perform in their system? I believe so, okay. yeah. I believe that the information is stored. Has Captain Pintoval spoken well, to either one of the municipalities to see if there's maybe a way that, and I'm not arguing money, I'm just talking in general, that it could possibly save us money if we became a user with their account rather than, you know, a, a new module? You yeah, know, if sure you don't understand what I'm saying, because I know you, that the towns and the villages, if they have uh, properties that are off their main site, right. they right. enter a user agreement for that new workstation, but it doesn't require them to actually buy the software. I, I think you understand you may, what I'm saying? You may be licensing the software on each computer. So right. if you're not sharing the computers, you won't be able to share, I don't know, the usernames. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, I, I think. have to check with Captain Pinnacle. Stu's point is a very good point because if there's a possibility that we could piggyback the town's contract mm -hmm. and not get them, you know, basically we're, go we're all going to have the same permissions, right? right. We're not going to really care much. And so um, I don't think there's any holdback from the board wanting to do this stuff. No. We just want to do it in an efficient way. I mean, it gives you guys access. Somebody amends the, uh, for no, a new CFO, right. and his new building plan. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. You guys get to see that the fire scene before you get to go into the building if you want to, mm -hmm. correct? I, I believe so. Yeah, that's what, yeah. that's what yeah, we're talking right. about. Just from what I've read. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. We, I, yeah I have to go with when would this take place? Like when would, it, when would it be effective? Like as soon as you sign it, probably. Yeah, I would imagine as soon as they sign up, yeah. and you know, they could do it immediately on their desktop computer. It's just when we got the mobile units, we could, uh, you know, load it, the program is, on. Is there? And I'm just because we're addressing this is new mm -hmm. to us. This would be amendments, right? New things were filed. Is there any plan to like how are you going to get the old stuff? Is it would have to be manually be loaded standard, into right? there, yeah. So I, I think it would be plan. going forward. Okay. I don't so know that if they we're gonna, If we're going to buy into this, mm -hmm. that may be something you want to ask right. and spearhead. Sure. Maybe I think Bronxville using it. Talk, Bronxville and East Chester right. are using it already. East Chester just voted to upgrade their software, which is now going to allow us to be able to get their information. They had an older version. Bronxville has had it for a while. The newer, I think it's a 5. Dot or whatever the software version is. So Bronxville could have shared with us sooner if we had belonged. But now that the town is going to do it, this is why Captain Pinnaval, because now two of the three municipalities that we serve, you know, he'll have access to their information. I think it's worth the phone call. Sure. Maybe Stu can lobby sure. that call in or I can lobby that call There's in. There's no objection. I'm more than happy to. Yeah, lob absolutely. that phone call in and yeah. say, hey, by the way, you know, and try and see if Tucko can we piggyback off the yeah, town? I don't know what yeah, Tucko I mean, why, why, software yeah, they use. Tucko I mean, might the three be different. Municipalities plus the fire district to enter into Tuck some kind home. of a relationship with this would seem like a no brainer since it's covering all 18,000, whatever, plus 27,000 mm -hmm. people and right. wherever they live. It, yeah, yeah. it would it would be a good venture. Yeah, and Tuckahoe, Tuckahoe's, it'd be, the town would be the most logical because it's the same mm -hmm. exact group, right? Yeah, I would. I mean, I don't think there's any objection. Right. I think the only question is, should we go back and try to renegotiate to piggyback one of the town's contracts? We can try. I'll, do you think I'll that's fair? To, uh, I think it's fair. I mean, do we need to approve it based upon that? And like, I think just the so discretionary we can number forward? is low enough. The chief can. Okay. Is that fair yes. to you? Because we don't okay. need a special resolution yeah, on five thousand dollar. So let's see if we can make headway it. in a week, and then whatever. Okay. Maybe maybe it's something for two thousand and twenty. I'll even if that's the worst case, you know, yeah. Keep information. Keep posted, keep posted, but we want yep. to do it sooner. We're 19, later. sorry. Okay. If it's in right. your discretionary okay. I think Jamie uh, wants to go home. She yeah. can be excused. Yeah, you can split, you Jamie. Can, yeah. Can I just say something about this? Because I'm looking at the contract. The, the costs are in here. 
it's split between the town of Eastchester's investment and our investment. Okay. And it looks like they're charging the same costs to, to both. It's just that they're going to have two users and we're going to have three users. <coughs> so I actually, and actually their maintenance, their year, uh, next year maintenance is higher. So that is the town of Eastchester costs are laid out in here also. So we could certainly make the phone call. I'm, I'm just not sure that it'll make a difference. But I think the salesman already figured it out. See where the odds of that. Maybe we can talk to the. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. But chief, if I can speak for the board, and you guys can shoot sure. me down if I'm wrong, I would just try to negotiate the best deal you can. Okay. Keeping in mind what we're trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah. Yep. I'll talk to Kevin and I'll do it. Yeah. Yep. Very good. And before they publish it on TV, so they know the deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, after last month's meeting, the commissioners indicated that they would prefer not to use the Chester Heights Firehouse for public uh, functions. Um, I've, I've notified Tucko School Superintendent, Mr. Carl Albano, as they had a request in to use that for a possible bond referendum in December. I notified them that Chester Heights Firehouse would not be available for their possible bond referendum. Um, and, you know, he, it, it, we're giving them enough time to make alternative plans if necessary. I don't know what they're going to do, but you know, it's, it's the reason that we're allowing them to do the primary election there tomorrow is the Board of Legislators said that it was too late to make alternate plans. So we're allowing them to do their uh, primary election there tomorrow, but that I guess basically is going to be the last thing for the public to use the firehouse until the construction projects are uh, completed. Um, I spoke with Dr. Flores again about us doing a Narcan uh, naloxone uh, treatment for people that have opioid overdoses and also about us it's instituting an epinephrine or EpiPen for people with uh, allergic reactions. Um, it's still in the approval process, uh, so there's no progress on that. Uh, he's going to check back with uh, REMSCO, the Regional EMS Council, uh, which he's, he is a board member of, uh, he stated to me. So uh, he's looking into it, and we're going to try to move forward with that as soon as we can. Um, the epinephrine can be a little expensive. The uh, EpiPens are, I believe, in the neighborhood of about $600 a piece. And each apparatus would need uh, two adult doses and two EpiPen juniors. So you're talking $2,400 per apparatus. And I've been told that they're only good for approximately a year. So you're talking about $10,000, $12,000, depending on if we put them on the ladder trucks. Uh, a year to carry that, you know, which is definitely a life-saving me medicine if somebody's having an anaphylaxic shock or an allergic reaction to food or a bee sting. Um, so we're trying to move forward with that. Um, again, there is money in the budget for 2017 in the EMS line. Um, there's enough money left so that if we do want to institute those, uh, we don't uh, have to wait until next year's budget. Um, Due to the fact that so many of the EFD policies and procedures have not been updated in quite some time, and some of the information that we had sent to PESH had not been updated since 1992, and they wouldn't accept it, they said it needed to be revised before they would accept it. Um, I have been researching a management software program called Lexipol Fire. It provides a state-specific, so New York-specific, customizable fire policy content with online training. I have some sample uh, programs from the Tucko Police Department. Um, one is their PPE, Personal Protective Equipment Policy, and a Standards of Conduct Policy. So basically would allow us to uh, grab whichever one of their policies that they have um, for rules and regulations. Right now we have the, the little red books that haven't been updated in many years, and they're very vague, and there's not a lot of rules and regulations in them. The Tucko Police Department and the Eastchester Police Department both use this software on the police side. So they have Lexapol Police and Lexapol Fire. Um, they're both happy with it. Um, it provides online training. So when there's a rule or regulation update, the firefighters can access the, if they want to, they can download the app onto their phones or tablets or computers. Um, if they choose not to do that, we can provide computers in each firehouse that they will have access to this rules and regulations online, um, which I actually spoke to the commissioners at my interview for chief. I said, we need to get the rules and regulations out there. We need to update them. So this is one of the ways that I found. Um, it's not cheap. It would cost, the first year would cost $8,821. Um, that includes a little bit of a discount, um, but that also includes eight hours 
of implementation because their rules and regulations may not meet our needs. So right. it includes eight hours of online or over the phone um, interaction with us to merge our rules and regulations with their form rules and regulations. So I think it would be a great idea. We can go from having no rules and regulations to hundreds and hundreds and pick and choose the ones that we need and make them fit to the East Chester Fire District. Um, so I, some, of the uh, some of the firehouses do not have internet access through the district. They have uh, the firefighters chip in and get their own internet access. But I would recommend that we also upgrade so that we have internet um, in each firehouse and get them a desktop computer so that, you know, if they need to do training, some of the guys uh, do some mutuals and they might not get the training that day. Well, they can go online for an hour when they come in at the evening shift and they can get their training online and you know it's not going to interrupt everybody else you know with their other activities so chief what you're saying is you're trying to bring us into a more technology state that we pretty much have not been in and so this is uh we are doing it now after all the software has been written and we don't have legacy software to deal with we have all virgin products to deal with and you can bring in all these tested materials because we didn't bog ourselves down with legacy systems they said the implementation would be easier because we have fewer rules and regulations whereas the police <laughs> department have binders that are eight inches thick and it takes them longer to merge their rules and regulations see i'm trying so, to spin a positive to yeah, this well, i thought that was <laughs> <laughs> it'll so, be it'll be less time because if we go over the eight hours of implementation then you pay an hourly rate so right the, you're going to end up i think the legal bill will probably be the highest part because before you implement any rules and regs, right. you're probably going to have a full conversation with a lawyer, Absolutely. and that'll be 200 to 300 dollars an hour, and it'll dwarf the technology uh, side of this equation. Yep. But that said, I don't know if anybody's going to debate that this has to be done. They have also vetted it with their attorneys on their side, but of course, we would want to run it by our attorneys. But you, you, everything should comply with the New York State rules and regulations because they go state by state. And right, right. Well, so. you'll have a you can do that and you work with our board member, whoever that's appointed, and work all through all that. Yeah. So I asked for permission to sign a contract. If you commissioners are not ready to Again, do that, that's. Again, can we piggyback since the town has it already? Can we piggyback one of the town licenses? If the town's using this, the town police department, right? can we somehow get that salesman to say, okay. That was part of the discount. If you, I, I had given you a copy of the proposal underneath my office. Of I, I, didn't, I didn't get it here till so, tonight. I got it here, but I didn't read it yet. Right. So if you go to the last so page. So you've, you've already gone down that road. There's a $464 discount because East Chester and Tuckahoe Police Departments are using it. So that was already taken into consideration. Okay. Yeah. So anybody have any problems with the chief executing that? No. Nope. Do you want us to do that by formal resolution? I probably should because it's a pretty it's, serious matter. It's 8800 bucks. So. Yeah, but it's not the 8000 It's okay. the it's the idea that we're creating new policies and procedures that okay. we don't want somebody down the road to say that the chief okay. did this without the board's blessing. I have to say, chief, this report today is uh, really great. I mean, it's basically a roadmap, if you will, towards actual shared services for our first responders, which I think today I'm happy to see that we're, we're talking about that option. I mean, just like the mm -hmm. chairman said, is the town uses it, us, possibility of other municipalities coming in. I do have a question, though, based upon that before we get to the execution. You mentioned earlier this, and we've talked about it, this right. Narcan, yep. everything. Um, what's the chances? I mean, we know, right, who carries it? EVAC? Yes. EFD, EPD, TPD, and Bronxville Police Department, somebody, right. they all use it. Right. And we're all paying separately for it. Um, the health department provides a Narcan for free. Right. The only problem is that there's a, they said there's a huge backlog. So if we ask for it tomorrow, it may be six months before we get it. Right. But what about so, the, the, Epi, the uh, EpiPen? I don't know that the, the police department carries the EpiPen. They may, but I know EVAC does. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the police department carries the EpiPens. Um, Do you think there's a good chance that there's... A police officer who carries an EpiPen or no? You don't think uh, that's their personal one? Yeah, the School? schools. The okay, students well, have even to better. Them with the nurses. Uh, there's an opportunity here for us to try and buy these things together. Sure. Yeah, and uh, you know, the more people, the more pens, probably the less per pen we can get it for. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think the evac and the I think town and the evac and the town and villages right. and the school district now I think would also be a, a well worthwhile the, the, I think the, the parents supply yeah, the students yeah, school school provide right. them yeah. through their probably their medical insurance yeah. somebody point. told me there's like a hundred in the Bronxville school EpiPens or something but some there, crazy large number we may see another opportunity here for cost-effective savings right. if we're able to buy EpiPens uh, through just uh, maybe not just us buying them for us right, right. these EpiPens obviously are used if you are the responding party right. to an event like this mm -hmm. but evac generally has them always on them right? yeah, yeah so, the ambulances would have them okay so this would be a supportive EpiPen provision well, the idea is that you know if there's a call up on the north end you know evac is going to take their five minutes or so to get there mm -hmm. the north end fire engine may be there within two minutes you know okay. so the idea is to you know get right. it to the closest yeah. whether it's a police car or a fire truck whatever the closest emergency response vehicle is like Dennis said before maybe there's an opportunity to piggyback with evac on right, how they're can, purchasing these yeah. we can touch base with them and see they want to talk to Karen where they get that yeah. okay okay so um, and just finally on uh, so did we do did you approve the uh, yeah well if you, poll or do you have to pull the board um, somebody have, the, just have the this report so I can go give me a report I'll do the resolution real quick Okay, Lexapol. Uh, motion to approve Lexapol to approve the chief executing a contract with Lexapol. Uh, I don't know their last name. They just say Lexapol. With Lexapol to provide software to the fire department for uh, policies and for policy manual and training and data. I guess it's online training and the the online manual. As per the agreement supplied, uh, is there a date on this agreement? I'm looking for a date. Yeah, it's the second to last page. We probably have the date. Okay, I'll just use the amount then. For a, 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 a total cost of $8,821. Um, and we're going to authorize the chief to execute that agreement with Lexapol to provide the software package. Yeah, I'll second that. So, you want to make that motion? Yep, no. I'll make the motion. Okay, you make I'll the motion. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Chief. Okay, thank you. And in closing, I just wish to recognize all the firefighters, police officers, EMS workers, military members, and civilians lost on 9-11 terrorist attack, and just to say that we will never forget them. Agree. Um, I think we're back. We're, oh, we just got to pay the bills and we'll go to public comments. How's that sound? And any, Stephen, do you have any comments for us? You don't want to come up and praise your brother's beautiful effort he gave earlier today <laughs> okay um, okay so we have uh, three two warrants and one credit card bill and then Jamie can call ma'am after we do this um, so we have a, a first warrant is for hundred eighty five thousand one hundred fifty four dollars and thirty four six cents the other warrant is one eighty six three eighty six spot ninety six the credit card bill is $182.79 for a total warrant of $371.724 spot 09. Who would like to make a motion to pay those? What did you say the total amount was? 371.724 spot 09. Okay. I could have inverted it. I do that all the time. Yeah. Yep. I'll make a motion. Mr. Baker. Second. I'll second. Mr. Raven. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now, uh, the next thing on the agenda is public comment. Any public comment tonight? I, I, I think from now, I just want to say on public comment, I think from now on, if when meetings are going to last this long, I think the public comment should go first because it's not fair to make people stay this late. They got to get up and go to work in the morning. That's, that's a good, that, I agree with that. I agree with that. We should have a, a comment for work. You're welcome to come up. Evening. Only because I'm a warrior. Um, you State your name for the board. Oh, sure. Yeah. Ellen Del Cole, 10 Field End Lane, East Chester. As I said, just because I'm a warrior, you mentioned lawsuits. And I wondered if anything was built in to the budget because I see that uh, 
as you mentioned, the contingency line has been moved into 3410.2 for fire equipment and capital outlay. Um, it wouldn't be covered, I don't think, under insurance. No, what happened was the contingency line on the, at the request of our orders was asked to be moved. Jamie can correct me if I'm, and uh, if you remember last year at this time, we were still negotiating a contract with the labor right. union. And so therefore, uh, contingency was one of those things in that we had kind of in there in case the labor contract went askew. Uh, so that was the contingency line. We don't have any line for, right, right now the town of East Chester is, has a $400,000 possible. If they win, they're going to get about $400,000. Uh, we don't have any. The other lawsuits that are pending are probably in the $100,000 mark if the, you know, maybe, if they're, they're, they're not, they're not material to the overall budget of the fire department. Well, you, you just mentioned the East Chester. Uh, that one's about the fire hydrants. Yes, the hydrants. That came up at the last town board meeting, and I was there. And when the question was raised at the end of the meeting, uh, it was said that, unless I'm wrong, I, because it was responded to by the supervisor, uh, that uh, a settlement that there was talk of a settlement between the two parties we have never received a written offer of a settlement from the fire district from the from the town okay. the town can let that that lawsuit could go away tomorrow without any kind of settlement by all they'd have to do is go tell the judge they want to dismiss it with prejudice and that would be like a beautiful thing and therefore the then it just goes away and we don't hear about it and they walk away and uh, and, and we don't have to defend the lawsuit any longer. The crux of that lawsuit is, and I'll explain it since we're in Tuckahoe here, and I don't want to go on long because this has been a long night. Yep. Um, the village of Tuckahoe and the village of Bronxville petitioned the Public Service Commission around 2014 to make the residents pay the hydrant bill. So the residents in Tuckahoe and Bronxville in their monthly, credit, in their monthly bill for, the high, for their water company bill they have a municipal service charge, and that municipal service charge is to pay for hydrants. If you live in East Chester, East Chester, the, I always think it's the town outside the two villages, you don't get that on your monthly water bill. Your monthly water bill comes in like $20 a month less or something because you don't have that on there, um, which is de minimis in, in the water company's billing these days. So, um, but in any case, the people in East Chester, East Chester, are not paying that charge. We have, we passed a budget tonight of 16 odd million dollars, 16, eight or something. That cost is gonna be spread probably 36% for Bronxville, I'm guessing numbers, you know, 32% of something Bronxville, 28% for Tuckahoe, and the balance to the town of East Chester. It's one tax levy. So you'll be taking tax dollars from Tuckahoe and Bronxville, and taking that money and giving it to the town, which doesn't seem fair to us that it's going to pay the people in Bronxville and Tuckahoe effectively, if I can boil it down, will be paying twice for the hydrants. Once from the fire department's tax bill and once from their water bill, if you live in Bronxville or Tuckahoe. We don't think that's fair. We think that, that and this is because going back, and we don't know how many years, there was some kind of informal arrangement that we were paying a percentage of the hydrant bill back to Bronxville, Tuckahoe, and East Chester. We're not paying Bronxville and Tuckahoe anymore, so we didn't think it was fair. We should pay East Chester. That's the crux of the whole lawsuit. No, I just, it, the, way that, the way that it came across, and I was in the room, was that, I guess, the fire district wanted to settle with the town. That was the way that I, I got We could. Case. We would love to settle at zero, would be great, um, <laughs> but our, and maybe you could look at the first year this happened, because in the 2014, Jerry can nod his head, 2015 budget, 2015 budget, I think we had $132,000 budget line in there where we, where we had in our budget line for hydrants. So the town could have the argument, well, you had $132,000 in there, and a third of that was the town's portion. We should get a third back of that 132. They could have that argument. And I don't think this board would argue it. I don't know if your members would think. 
But um, I don't think anybody's going to argue that we should pay, Bronxville and Tuckahoe should pay 2015, I mean 16, 17, 18, 19. If you look at this budget right here, there is no hydrant in this budget, but there was in 2015. So, you know, they could have that argument. And I think we've always said to, the, to our lawyers, if the town wants to settle, they should send a letter over and put a proposal together what they want to settle for. And then we can look at it and see if it's rational or not. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to step up to the mic besides this strange gentleman? Jerry Platano, 11 Bronson Avenue. I'm actually here representing the Green Knolls. How are you doing, area. Jerry? So real quick, I wanted to say sorry to see the way you guys are having them in fighting. I remember those days. Hopefully it won't continue. Um, I want to ask a question to each one of you commissioners because I think of our public doesn't know this. And it's not pointed in every way. I think it's really in a way to communicate to our citizens how much power each one of you have versus the chairman. Anthony, do you feel you have more power or less power than the chairman? Jerry, when I went to the... It's a yes or no. I'm, I'm, no, no. Let me, let me explain it to you. When I went to the commissioner's school, yeah. okay, and I asked that question, the same question you're asking, they said the only power that the chairman has is at the meeting. That's it. Otherwise, you are all equal. The chairman of the right. uh, of, of the board of fire commissions just presides over the over right. the meeting. So, so and I'm the rest of us, that. we so, have so I'm very the same power. I'm glad to hear that because okay. that is the truth. The only additional responsibility that the chairman has is to schedule the meeting. Okay. Every one of you have equal vote. You can't hide behind the fact that you were misinterpreted or misinformed by another commissioner. You all have the same right. You all should be, you, you, you might feel that the, the chairman is on a bully pulpit for a period of time. That might be related because of his personality. It might be related because he's the one who's spending the most amount of time in the district, right? But you can't hide behind the fact that you feel you've been misinformed by the chairman or any other member because you all have equal vote. You're all voted in equally. And the only additional responsibility the chairman has is scheduling the meeting and nothing else. That's not completely accurate. It is. No, it is it's not. He can it's call the meeting, not schedule it. The schedule for our meeting is set in our bylaws, which is supposed to be the second Thursday of every month, which we are not following. It's not to schedule. It is to call the meeting based upon our bylaws, not to schedule it. No. That's a tradition that was picked up at some point. You're the freshest trained commissioner. Thank you. Because you just went, right? And okay, I'll pass you the responsibility of Great, thanks. But I think I think Mr. So, come on. Politano's point. If you look at our press release of the beginning of our meeting from the beginning of the year, what we put in the journal news. Thank you. I think it says the meetings will be posted on the website and in the firehouses, and that supersedes your bylaws. We never we, no, passed no, no, a no, no, we no, never so passed a resolution sorry, to remove the bylaws. Go ahead, Jerry, go with Jerry you speak. What you're bringing up is a different issue. The reason I'm bringing it up is because the perception that the public has is that different members have different responsibility or different powers. You don't, regardless of whether you meet every other Thursday or regardless of whether you meet every other Monday. That has nothing to do with what my point that I'm bringing across. I understand your point. I don't totally disagree with either because if you get into a regular cadence of when citizens are expecting to be here, or listen or watch on TV, it becomes old hat for them, right? And I think maybe you should try your best to just come to an agreement on when you can best meet and move forward. Whether it's Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, that's up to you guys to make a decision. All right, so that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to reinforce that. All right, um, thanks for the update on the DeCostanza case because as you know, he's personally suing me as well and the fire district I heard tonight is going to continue to represent me. Okay. Um, what I didn't like what happened last week and when you voted is exactly what I just said. You all have equal power. Now by handcuffing the other four commissioners because Peter Inkladon has full responsibility with the lawyers, I don't think that's legal. Because what's going to be next? You're in the finance committee and you're going to be the only one to be able to communicate with Jamie? I'm appointed. I'm just giving you an example. Okay. You can't restrict other, communica other communications from other any commissioners are communicating to any other members. Period. That's, that's simple. Whether you guys feel that, that
Dennis had more an influence, you can't hide behind that. You all have equal responsibility to change that from a gentleman's agreement and move forward. Okay? I totally agree there needs to be a single point of contact talking to the law firm. I agree with that. Actually, Dennis and I set that up years ago. That was one of the agreements we made when we got on board, and we changed that as, as quick as we could. But to lock out commissioners, I totally disagree with. And I don't even really think that's legal. I, I don't think that, that might that's be actually what was intended, reasons, though, Jerry. On, that might actually be some of the reasons why the law firm backed out. After they made some kind of direction to you that they felt that they provided you with the verbiage that you needed to state, maybe they think that shouldn't be the right way to go. So. Well, Jerry, don't, don't you think if that was the case, they would have, when I asked them if there were any changes that we could make as a district, they would have said, change that provision so that, as a practical matter, we have free speech in this country. And Dennis and Stephen and uh, Commissioner Lori and Commissioner Rabin are free to contact the attorneys at any time and say anything they want, okay? However, the what, what is restricted is whether or not the attorneys will start charging the fire district money based on any thought that comes in into individual commissioner's head that they send to the attorney. And yes, we did appoint a gatekeeper, which in this case is me. Dennis has acted in that role on a de facto basis for the last five years. And nobody is trying to withhold, you know, uh, legal resources from any member of this board. In fact, we never even got a chance to implement it before we threatened to fire these guys. And, you know, like, so to, to suggest that the reason why they backed out is because they suggested something that was improper, I, I want to retain these guys. I have been clear to that with this board. I've been clear about that with the attorneys. I agree with Dennis's earlier statements that these attorneys are great. They're fairly priced. They're good at what they do. I'd like to retain them. If it was simple as us basically changing that motion that we passed so that basically anyone could contact the attorneys at any time, I would, that would be significant enough for me that, you know, just so that's stated, I would still want a gatekeeper that they're not spending money, I would be willing to make that change. That is not why they're backing out. They are backing out because they are concerned that we have threatened to bring legal action against them. They never said that. That's true. Well, that's for you guys. That, 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 that is my opinion, but in, from, from the outside looking, looking, what happened? I just don't understand why that resolution was even passed. It, it, it's meaningless because of the responsibility that you all equally have. It, it was it was just interrogating the entire board why, for why, no reason. Why why do we have an administrator for technology? Why do we have one person that's who, not what you, who? That's not what I understood happened at your last meeting. As a matter of fact, even the chief asked the question, I have personnel matters or 207A, how do I have to communicate with them? Because I've been communicating directly with the law firm. You guys all and, said no. And, now and, you have and to that is, that, no, that is resolved with one okay, email well, from, one, one email from, from the point you of contact to, to the attorneys that says, that. on all matters related to XYZ, the chief can deal directly with counsel from this date going forward. The, the treasurer can deal with counsel on this date going forward. We were advised on that by, we by the attorneys. We did not make that change. We did not amend the resolution that I know of yet. If you okay. want to well, unilaterally well, make that. Paul said on the phone that that's how it, it would, that I could basically give a, an authority for the chief to discuss that's all not, legal that's matters. How, that's how the resolution was read. See, what uh, happens? I, 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 I think that is how the resolution was. But, Jerry, I'll tell you what. If, if we need to fine-tune the resolution, I think the reasons why we passed it were good reasons. I've kind of gone into detail on what those reasons are. I think it's similar to having a IT administrator. Someone, why aren't we all capable of basically going in and, and okay, you know. But my point is you didn't need to pass a resolution. That was already in place. You already had a single point of contact with the law firm. And that's, that's basically what you're headed to now. You're just looking to have a different single point of contact, which is fine with me as a citizen. I don't mind with that. But that's where you guys are headed. I don't understand why they had to be a the technology head and actually set up most are Twitter accounts, Facebook account, uh, not Facebook, we don't have Facebook, but YouTube, the channel, um, everything that we had, the Google Drive. And when after the election last year, and we needed to have somebody do it, right? And so 
Jerry said, Dennis, in the end of December, okay, you got to learn how to do YouTube. It takes about an hour to load that page, two hours. You got to learn how to do Twitter, which I haven't done yet. You have to do Google Drive. You have to do this. So I did it because I am kind of up the curve on technology and we talk the same language and I got it done. Ideally, ideally, we want to give that to somebody, the chief, when he gets more settled in and that office gets a little cleaned out a little more. And then, but I'm just saying, Jim Peters mentioned a couple times that he would like to access, but we want to turn that over to the career department. It shouldn't be for a board member to do. The technology should be an outside vendor, not a board member to do. It should be the chief finding an outside vendor here, do all this technology stuff. It's not, I'm doing it at a default because there's nobody else to do it at this moment in time. I, I don't want to do it. I'm just saying that we have one person who's responsible for that. And having one person as a point of contact, listen, I don't think it's going to be, be challenged. And, you know, my goal is to, to try to implement this in any, with any successful law firm that we look to hire. And if it turns out that it's not enforceable, then it's going to go away. Because I'm not going to do something that we think is, you know, unenforceable. Or, 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 or since I'm being mentioned in this in this lawsuit can i call the law firm directly absolutely okay. you're a named party absolutely this like is right. but this is like this, but but anything. but this is this was all been made clear to the board members who are the ones who are the points if you're a named party you can deal directly with the attorneys at any time and they will deal directly with you and that was made clear i don't know if you've spoken to dennis since the last meeting and you know i, I would assume you have and that you've had concern about all right well if you Sorry haven't this, yeah. but uh, you know like listen um anytime you want to call me i'll explain to you what i know if, if you have concerns and i'm happy to do it and i'll discuss it with the board and we'll try to get you an answer but i, I honestly don't feel that this policy is restricting anyone's ability to contact the attorneys in a material way okay. but it is safeguarding the district from wasting legal resources okay and and like i, I said, said because I don't, I don't see this as being president because then what's the next thing you're going to say the finance commissioner can only talk to the treasurer no you don't want that to happen i don't want that path to occur and that's what it seemed like in the last meeting was going to happen particularly when you ended the meeting at the end where you said that the chief couldn't even respond to the law firm with 207a you fixed that now i understand no we that's haven't why I'm asking that, the question. that has not that amendment has not happened if the board wants to amend the resolution where the chief can communicate then that'll have to be amended by resolution it, it, uh, same thing with the right, treasurer. you guys decide that on your own it, that's, that's an like i said session if if there are legitimate uh concerns and 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 issues with what we've done of course i am open to getting counsel from our attorneys discussing it amongst the board discussing it with the people who need to access you know legal counsel and making appropriate changes but the spirit of why this was passed and the fact that it was dismissed immediately before it was even passed <coughs> and that it resulted in a threat of firing and legal action to our attorneys is a much bigger issue well, and one, I, I one that i think way. one that one I, that i think the other way the <laughs> spirit of why was was basically addressed is because people's feelings got hurt about their families and i'm done okay let me go on to my next subject jerry before you go on to your next subject whether people like this or not this has been adopted october 14 1999 by the board of fire commissioners on page five section four and it reads, and at the, chairman of, the chairman of the Board of Fire Commissioners was Commissioner Raymond Albanese at that time. And it states in here in Section 4, the regular meeting of the Board of Fire Commissioners shall be held on the second Thursday of each month, 8 o'clock p.m. at the fire headquarters or such other places the fire district may be des designated by the Board of Fire Commissioners. I'm not that. Okay, but I'm just I'm saying, kind of we, we, have, we haven't followed... We haven't followed this at all since. But there's reasons for that, and you can decide as a board. But I'm just telling you, they, they put stop signs and red lights where I don't like them, too, but we got to stop by them. We should still abide by this, and we haven't abided by this because we're going by we Dennis's rules. Yeah, I know that, but we, that's once, twice, three times during the year. This is what it states when the, when the meeting is here. Okay. Okay. I just want to be clear. Is that the only thing we're going to follow in that book? 
No, you're going to follow the whole rules and regulations if you yeah, want. Yeah, and, and that's a shame because that's, that's the rules and regulations. In that book. Pardon me? That's almost everything in that book. Okay, so why don't we follow them? Okay, well, you know what? Next. Because you don't have a volunteer department anymore. But this is not volunteer. This doesn't say anything about volunteer, Dennis. Where does this say about volunteer the meeting? That's not. That's one thing in the book. You guys are always knocking everybody that's not supposed to be knocked. This is saying when the meeting's supposed to be done. It's got nothing to so do with the volunteers. No, you're supposed to follow the whole thing. That's the rules and regulations. Right, so you guys figure out the, the meeting. Okay, thank you. Jerry, I so, appreciate you coming back and, and just watching right, this. La last thing, this is brought to my attention. I don't think the board is aware of this. So this is a photograph with uh, the lawyer, the VO, uh, volunteer. President and Commissioner Lori at a, at a dinner. fundraiser dinner. The fundraiser dinner occurred after the fire was destroyed. It occurred at the, at the Fountainhead. Correct. And okay. It occurred after we sued the VOW, the, the volunteer department. So, what's the picture got to do? I could take a picture with anybody. $85 a seat there. Did you pay? Yeah. $85? Yes. I would recommend now that the board has that, that you would in that receipt because as a citizen that was worth to my attention i see that as a conflict of interest i don't we're talking millions of dollars and and i can't go to a dinner i can't go to a dinner no you can't fraternize with, with, with the party that you're suing now you have equal Jerry, responsibility how many people were at this event there was over there was there was over 250 uh, members there people there so so you you have you ever gone to the Have you ever gone to the locals' dinner? Have you ever been invited there to go to the? the yeah. f did you go? That's got nothing to do with it. I I, I paid my own I paid my own freight. You're included in this, Dave. Okay. Because I went to this dinner, I'm in violation. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, you think so. I don't think so. Okay. That's fine. And then, so the other thing, EpiPens, I would recommend that they get them, right? Because they are the first responders on the most part. I know schools have them already. They probably have too many. EpiPens, actually, you could get them generically for under $300. But... Um, I think it just ends up being who's the first responder if such a situation would occur, that's who should have it. And on the most part, it's always the firemen who are there first because the trucks are always getting there first before everybody, on the most part. On the most part, from a percentage perspective, that's probably even true with, with EMS. So that's my two cents on that front. All right. Thanks, guys. Jerry, thank you for coming and taking the time. And um, Thanks for the photos, good Jerry. Good to see you at the meeting. I appreciate them. Anybody else for public comment? Smith, um, Bronxville. I would just like to follow up with um, a question about the discussion of the code of ethics, which was not mentioned. And I think a point was just made when Jerry was just talking about the perception of a conflict of interest. The code of ethics, one of the points of the code of ethics and ethics and policies is to eliminate the personal and the particular. We've had a huge discussion tonight, a very, very long discussion. And things have gotten very personal and very particular. And I think it's really important as a member of the public, the fire district is supposed to be absent of any particular personal interest in matters to keep it very fair and equitable and it's not really the question really isn't whether someone actually had a conflict of interest yes that's very important but the question from the public's point of view is is there a perception 
of a conflict of interest. And I think that is worthy of a conversation, of a discussion with this board, not only with the board, but I think it would be very important to open up the discussion with the committee, including the public, that you're supposed to be representing in a very, very impartial way. So I know it's a very long night, but I think it's very much worthwhile to have a discussion with the board, with the public, about a code of ethics. Expanding it, yes, I think it probably does need to be expanded. But again, it's not whether anyone really has a particular conflict, but to avoid the appearance that is very important. Thank you. Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, I could give you a... I could say something that you just said, let's not get personal. When I was running for fire commissioner, Commissioner Winters, former Commissioner Nagel, put in the paper about me that I was not... Napolitano, I'm sorry, Commissioner Napolitano put in the papers about me that I wasn't qualified, I didn't know nothing about uh, business background, that I should, they want to run this organization like a business, not like a fire department. That's what they had said in the paper. And they, they also said that I wasn't college graduate, and I'm not. I went as far as high school, then I did 27 years of military service, and I went to the College of Hard Knocks. I worked after that, and I'm still working. I'm semi-retired, and I'm still working. But you're talking about getting personal? Ask those two guys how personal they got about me. Yes, well, excuse me, Commissioner Lori. I'm not saying whether someone... Well, I, I took offensive to that when they did that to me. But that was okay because they did it. And no one, no one came up here like you and said that let's not get personal. And I, and, and I, I let the lawyer know about that this evening over the phone. I took that very offensively. I've been a native of this, this community for 68 years. I was born and raised in Tuckahoe. I wasn't born in Bronxville or New Rochelle or Mount Vernon. I was born in Tuckahoe, and my roots are here, and I'm here to stay, and I hope the good Lord, when he has to take me, he takes me from the village of Tuckahoe. That's how much I love this town. I'm not a carpet beggar. I'm not a Johnny-come-lately. I'm a native of this village, and I plan to stay here until the good Lord takes me. I wasn't speaking about personal comments. I was speaking about a discussion regarding the code of ethics and how important it is to have a policy and a code which would eliminate a lot of personal and particular instances where people would be doing something that could be perceived as a conflict of interest. I, I don't think anybody disagrees that it's always worthwhile to review the code of ethics and strengthen it. I think what took place last week, though, was not just a discussion of improving, revisiting the code of ethics, but it was coupled with direct accusations of conflicts from the opinion of one man. And that's where I took issue, and that's why that, that kind of evolved into something that really was not good. So I, I have said to the attorneys uh, repeatedly that I ask for their guidance on issues, and if, if they believe that there is a true conflict, that I will recuse myself from, from those issues. And I think we should all do that. If we have good, talented attorneys who are willing to make those recommendations, I'm happy to do that. That's not what happened last week. Just to be clear, there was a discussion of improving the code of ethics, and then there was finger pointing of how several commissioners have violated the code of ethics. And that was one man's opinion, not our attorneys, and we can discuss it, but it certainly came across in a very accusatory way, and I think a lot of us took offense to it, and it wasn't well, right. I don't as think a member of the public, I think I would prefer to have things not be so personal or particular. I think it is very worthwhile. I think we do agree that it's important to have a discussion, and I think we should elevate the discussion, and I think we should include the public because very much a part of the 
code of ethics, the importance of the code of ethics is that the board should be absent any uh, conflict of interest or appearance of conflict of Ms. interest. Ms. Smith, it's Ms. Smith, right? I haven't seen you here before, but I, I think you've been to meetings. I think I've seen you on YouTube before, right? Um, I appreciate your comments, and I agree with you. In fact, two hours ago in our private session, I had recommended that we at the very least employ a triumphant of at least three residents, one from each town, one from each village, and one from the town, minimum, to sit as an advisory board, much like the Eastchester Police has, as a separate body of public people, not elected officials, not employees, to sit, maybe more than three, to have them sit down, and if there is an ethical question to be raised, that they should be given this initially, as they would be volunteering their time, it would not cost the district anything, and they could meet in station one in that back room and sit down and go over any matters they need to and at least come to an opinion of some sort that we can then take under advisement and then, as you know, go forward and see what happens. That was met with a little bit of pushback and was said that it would probably be better if we let the county get involved or pay a couple thousand dollars to a law firm to do it for us. So I agree with you, but the man in the middle said no. We'd probably be better off paying a couple thousand dollars to a law firm or have the county get involved. No, that's not. Uh, that is what happens. That's exactly I'm sorry. I am on your side, exactly and happened. I would support that. Well, I really would. I no. will one up you. I will one up you. Mm -hmm. As some people may know, I am a former school marm, and one of my uh, one of my regulations in the beginning of a school year was to lay all the cards out on the table for the kids. And I think the code of ethics, establishing a clear code of ethics involving the public, having a, a, a discussion, having the rules, the regulations, the code, the policy be very clear and agreed upon by the board and by members of the public with public input might eliminate some of the further kind of uh, animosity or whatever further committee yeah. work I think putting everything out there in the beginning clearly concisely agreed to by everyone eliminates a lot of problems and hopefully we wouldn't need to have any great big discussion after the fact I think it's better to put things clearly before the fact. I right. agree with you. It's probably all something that should be done about 15 to 20 years ago. That may be. Okay. Yeah, the Code of Ethics was adopted in 2007, and it calls for us to form a, an aid, uh, a committee uh, if we have an issue. And if you don't have a committee, the attorneys advised us, not that I want to speak about in our executive session discussion, but since we've already discussed it, um, the attorneys advised us we can go to Westchester County and see if they have a board of ethics, send them the opinion, the request for an opinion, and let them opine, and they'll probably do it on their dime. Uh, and then the third option is something we've done in the past, and the district has done this in the past uh, with other matters, is to retain an outside law firm. You pay them a few thousand dollars, you give them the facts, and you let them uh, write a, an opinion. When it comes to ethics opinions for commissioners, all of it, the question you're asking and the answer you get back is fully public information. There is no, there is no privacy in that question. So you get an answer back and the answer is the answer. And so we have three questions that we wanted answers to. One, and I'll just say them generically what they were. Uh, one, if a commissioner is a, is very, has a, an affiliation, call it that, with a, with a plaintiff, not a plaintiff, a defendant in a case, a party in the case. He's an employee of the town, which is currently about, suing the I was, fire district. I was talking about. I was talking about, about, about Mr. I don't know why we're mincing it. We've been talking about it at nauseum for nine months. All of a sudden, it's it's. I don't know if we'll just say generic. Okay. We went the last meeting. We went right through it. Let the bookends go at it. You want to mention my name? Mention my name, Dennis. So, are there any other public comments? Any more? Any more public comments? Would anybody else like to speak to the board? Yeah. All right. Oh, Chief Grogan. Hey. Haven't seen you in a while. Welcome back, Chief. How good to see you. No, no, I'm not welcome. I'm not coming back. No, 
Uh, Mike Grogan, 38 Lake Avenue, Tucko. Um, I, I caught the last meeting on the computer there today, and I, I'm a little shocked. Um, I, I don't know what happened. I, obviously, there's some bad blood suddenly, but it's not the board I left. I mean, it's like flashbacks 10, 15 years ago. They were dysfunctional, but he's blaming everybody. Please don't go back there. I will say, without getting into too many of other things, although a little interesting, Commissioner Laurie, that red book, what's the title of that red book that you just read from? Does Commissioner Baker mention volunteers? He always mentions volunteers. What's the title of the book? I don't always mention rules, rules and Regulations of the Volunteer Fire Department of the Town of East Chester, adopted October 14, 1990. It just has nothing to do with volunteers. That's the rules and regulations for the Volunteer Fire Department yeah, but of the Town of East Chester. This is done by the board. I, but it, it is involved. That's why I believe Commissioner Baker was pointing out. But, Thank you, and then the reorg meeting is when you set your meetings for that year, but we haven't written a new book. Um, also, Commissioner Lincoln, without getting into everything else, you mentioned about steps, Mary Lou's thing. I was there personally. I mean, a lot changed now. She was, by the full board's agreement, given additional monies for additional jobs. But to say something, you know, in a lot of civil service, look at your CBA that you signed with the starting five five salary goes up four times and, you know, it goes up 50% in four years. It's built in. A lot of positions have that where she started at a certain pay. She proved herself very well, and then it was decided to give a little bit more, and then she took over FOIL and health care to help me out because it was just everything fell on our laps. We went through a very difficult time, starting in 2013. And then when poor John passed away, it was devastating. We kept the ship afloat. Mike, it would, I, not, I, it I, would I, not have been done. I mean, I, I don't know how I got all done. Payroll, reports to the state, these, I'll tell you how I got it done, with the help of Mary Lou Falcone. I, I, I as I said earlier, I, I think I Mary Lou really is a good employee, and I don't want to, you know. A statement. Yeah. It's gotten very late. But what this all comes down to, I, I still see this. All of you, you're attacking this man that's put in more hours. That's another reason why this fire district's moving forward finally. Because Commissioner Winters has dedicated his more civic duty, and I, I just don't understand. Maybe a mistake once in a while. God knows we didn't always agree. But we agreed to disagree. We didn't yell and shout at each other. And quite honestly, if it wasn't for Commissioner Winters, I don't even know if this fine department still exists. I'm going to leave that. God bless 9-11. Um, and uh, pray for the people with all these hurricanes going on, too. So, good night. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for the kind words. Any other comments from the public? Make a motion. We call no, it. No, 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 okay. I, I, I want to get some more. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Mayor Eklund and the Board of Tuckahoe for the generous accommodation. I know uh, Commissioner Raven was very uh, instrumental in getting that, but I'd like to. I saw the mayor at the 9/11 uh, service this morning and thanked him. But I said I would say something publicly on behalf of the board. So, see you at the Boy Scout meetings and thank you very much. And now I turn it over to you. I would. Uh, say what's happened in the last two meetings is unfortunate and regrettable and uh i i wish that there was a way it you know for my own part that I, I i could have avoided this but i honestly you know didn't know how uh i will say that i still believe that uh the majority of the board is putting the town and the district first and foremost and despite the squabbling that you've seen in the last two meetings, uh, we've managed to hire a new secretary that I think is going to be a tremendous addition to the department. We've made significant progress on the roof at Chester Heights, which I believe will come in on budget and ahead of schedule. We've agreed to begin canvassing uh, to fill the fifth captain slot. We have, uh, you know, done a tremendous job, Commissioner Rabin, with our uh, treasurer on putting together a thoughtful and robust budget. Uh, and Chief Tween is, is taking the reins and, and done a tremendous job in the short time that he's been here. So there is forward progress. And I am trying to dedicate as much time as I can. Dennis does put in a lot of time. Nobody's ever disputed that. However, we need more time working together as a team and less time working against each other. 
and I am committed to kind of moving the ball forward here and getting things done. And I hope that everybody else shares that commitment. Concur. Now, uh, Peter mentioned something we skipped over during the meeting, and um, it's a new topic, which is good. Um, and that is the board is, is, is going to be uh, sending out canvas letters for the, for, the, for the next captain's position. We've left a captain's position uh, unfilled. We're going to fill that position as is. So that, that is going to, we're going to send out those canvas letters to the three candidates and we'll schedule a meeting and we've got to get the list from the county. So uh, that's where we are. So, um, and again, we'll close the meeting tonight in the memory of all those who died in 9-11 and um, including the servicemen and women who defend this country and became, um, you know, died and, and injured in battle and it's, uh, and, and all those people who did that. And I lost some very, very good friends in 9-11, people I worked with very closely. Um, but during 9-11, then my mother's birthday, September 15th, which was four days after 9-11, we were at, I'm one of nine, I'm one of nine, and we were at my mom's house uh, three days after 9-11 and four days after 9-11. And between my brothers, since we were all were brokers on Wall Street, we counted 55 names of people we knew. So it was fairly devastating. It is devastating. It's phenomenally devastating. So um, and we should close tonight's meeting in the memory of all those folks. Okay, motion to close the meeting. Make a motion to close the meeting. Mr. Baker and second. Um, and Mr. Aye. 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 Aye.